everybody a happy new year. Happy new year. Um, we can then switch it on. We do have a forum, so we maybe have the card open to the public. <coughs> Okay, so can I just then uh, obviously welcome everybody to the meeting this morning. Um, could I again just through the housekeeping uh, remind people that uh, could I switch all electronic devices and so on on to uh, silent, uh, and that would include putting uh, your tablets and on mute and so on. Um, just again remind people the screens would be viewed on the, uh, the cameras in the room as well. Um, I just got to ask members whenever, if they are, this is just to help each other uh, when we're doing our work, that if they're referring, using your, your, your electronic pack, if you could refer to the page number at the top of the page and where a submission has been numbered by any witness, could the member also refer to this table to just to try to avoid confusion as we, as we move through the meetings? Um, <coughs> other than that, um, Moving on then to apologies. An apology to Leclerc for Michael Copeland. Any um, other? Gregory Campbell. And apologies for Gregory Campbell. Thank you, Paula. Okay, so moving on then to the next item, which is the draft and that's not on page five of your pack. Um, uh, just to uh, ask members then to, if they're uh, content with the draft minutes of the meeting on the 12th of December 2013, yeah. for accuracy. There are no amendments required then, so we can uh, move on then. Thank you. Uh, matters are rising then. Item number three. Um, just to say that uh, an up we have an update, um, an update from the department on the social housing reform program has been scheduled to follow. Now this was an informal session which the department had thought would be helpful for the committee, which would be scheduled for the 13th of February, with a formal session to be held then on the 27th of February. Now, can I ask the members then, just if, if Kevin will just liaise with the department, because the department is also suggesting a workshop, for example, which they may hold, which could be beneficial for a committee attendance. So, could I say it in the first instance that, because we don't want to be doing additional meetings if we can avoid them, given they're having enough schedule. So, what I could suggest then is that we do have the formal briefing from the Department on Social Housing Reform Programme for the 27th of February. So we, we leave that in, and could Kevin then liaise with the department as to the need of an informal session before that, and any information around the uh, proposed workshop that the department wants to have, and then we bring that back to the committee next week. So just to again, people content then that we confirm the meeting uh, for 27th of February, the briefing from the department on that? Right. Members happy enough on that? Yep. Okay, thank you for that. Um, Again, I want to draw uh, members' attention and the sign is on page 11 of your pack. Uh, Donald Hoodless, the Chair of the Housing Executive, has replied to the Committee's queries uh, following his briefing to the Committee on the 20th of November. And that was, if you remember, regarding the plant dealers' contracts in the Campbell Tickell report. And on addition to page 3 of your tabled items pack, um, it's a clear order there. Members have been provided with a letter from Mr. Hoodless to Will Hare, and that relates to the Housing Executive's negotiations with plant maintenance contractors and the uh, concerns in relation to preserving the integrity of the negotiation process. Um, now, prior to asking um, or for us to determine our own view on this, um, uh, the Minister had requested an urgent meeting with myself uh, prior to Christmas to discuss this issue. I was unable to attend that meeting due to other uh, personal matters, and uh, the Deputy Chair and, and the Clerk, Kevin, attended the meeting. So I would ask uh, the Deputy Chair and or Kevin just to give a brief overview of that um, meeting. Well, the main um, issue was the planned maintenance contracts, and uh, we were led to believe that the <coughs> Negotiations with the contractors were almost completed. That may seem not to be the case now. The other issue uh, that was raised was the um, minister's statement to the um, assembly in relation to the eighteen million pounds, etc. Um, and the other issue that was raised by Mr. Hoodless was that he was adamant that the draft report of the Campbell Tickle report would not be made available to the committee. And I think his, his, his uh, terminology was, let's see in court, or words that effect. So, 
Um, that was the basis of that meeting. Um, but as I said, we were led to believe that the um, negotiations with contractors were virtually completed and that work would, would start fairly, fairly quickly. I mean, just on the last issue, first of all, I mean, it's quite clear from the legal advice we've got here today that we, we should have and can have access to it. It's also my understanding that the report itself, um, even though it's a very small sample, uh, it does indicate that the information which was available uh, or was given about the, uh, the, um, the amount of money owed by the contractors is far from um, clear, and indeed, um, given the sample, even if the housing executive were to try to pursue the contractors through the court, the sample wouldn't stand up to, to uh, any scrutiny uh, within the, um, the court. But I, I really do think, because this is causing immense problems for contractors with <coughs> mm -hmm. and I think we ought to be saying to the housing executive, We'll see if you have to see. We'll have to see you in court. We'll mm -hmm. see you in court. Um, uh, we, we're, we're, and give them early notice that we do not intend to be put off by them um, trying to delay things and, and talk about who owns the report and, and, and whether or not it's um, privileged and, and, and everything else. I think I really do think that we ought to be pursuing this because, to me, the the big scandal in all of this is the way in which contractors have been put in jeopardy and jobs have been put in jeopardy because of kind of careless figures being thrown around by the housing executive. Um, it's just on the, 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 the planned maintenance. I mean, it is disappointing to see that as a result of the um, negotiations not being completed, we're now given back another £7.1 million. Well, this, in this I mean, round. obviously we're going to come to that in, in part of the, in, in the monitoring round discussion, and that's obviously very, very important. Could I actually suggest, Tommy, on, on the back of what you're saying, that, uh, and just to complete the kind of introduction to this, I mean, members do have a legal uh, advice yeah. in your papers, and what I was going to suggest, and clearly, uh, and you've heard Mickey just given a very brief synopsis of the discussion that uh, he and Kevin had with uh, the Minister and, and with Donald Hoolis. There are a number of issues which are, are, are related to the need for us to have further discussions with Donald and, and whoever else uh, we need to. So could I suggest that we actually have the legal advice presented to the committee next week? With the view, and I, I think, I mean, you've, I think, fairly well encapsulated what the legal advice tells us that we can and should have uh, access to that if we want. But could it suggest? It's unusually that, clear for legal advice, I thought. <laughs> but could it, could it suggest then? <laughs> it could it suggest that we ask the legal service to come here then next week and just through school, that legal advice with us, just so everybody's happy that we have the proper advice, given the fact that it is legal advice, that we have the legal advice at our disposal. Um, and then we move forward swiftly from that point of view. I mean, and just to remind ourselves, this arose. Well, there's probably two parts. There's one is that members here wanted to see the draft and any draft reports of the Campbell Tickell report, and that was been denied to us. And we now have legal advice, which basically tells us the real reason for that. But for we actually took the legal advice formally to the committee, and then there are the other issues uh, relating to Donald Hoodless's evidence here, um, which. Um, doesn't appear to square with what our information would tell us now at the moment, and that is that there were other information given to an executive board that we were not been given access to. Sure. So, can we take the legal advice next week? Because otherwise, we'll have a kind of half to, to substantial discussion around this, which we, which we don't need to have. It's just, just a, a point on something. I think that I uh, read that we need to take a legal advice to move swiftly, uh, but uh, then the report that Mickey has given, I think. I have the sense that there, there seemed to be a certain uh, amount of arrogance there uh, well. in this moment. Uh, and uh, total disregard uh, for this committee and uh, well, what, what they've requested. Well, can we, can we remember to read then? We take a legal advice next week and then we move on to the basis of next week. Can the members read that? Ch Ch just one, although I agree the legal advice, but uh, given the plant maintenance contract, could we ask for a revised timetable from Mr. Hoodless then, given that we were given assurities that, um, that it would actually have been agreed by this stage? Okay. Well, in terms of the plan maintenance, I mean, obviously, we'll deal with that in the monitoring round, okay, part of well. the agenda okay. as well. Yeah. Okay. Members, happy enough for that.
Just another item there in terms of the uh, the monitor rating there. Uh, members will recall that uh, we have had a number of discussions around this issue of uh, the volunteering infrastructure funding, mm -hmm. and we've had uh, quite a number of engagements with volunteer now the organisation, and uh, we had a letter last received from them on the I think the twelfth. Uh, was provided to the members here on the twelfth of December. Um, so uh, the I think the committee did. We give it a fair amount of consideration, but we said we would return to that. So can I suggest that we deal with it uh, at our next meeting or potentially on the 23rd of January and just leave the scheduling to Kevin just to finalise that? Am I happy with that? Yep. Okay. Thank you for that. So moving then on to um, the, the next final item and matters are raising there. Uh, we had some time ago raised the issue of the Travellers Design Guides uh, from the Department. And the department has come back seeking uh, clarification if we, if we want to hear a briefing on that. So can we, can we just agree that we schedule that briefing in, in, uh, as, early as, as early as reasonable? Yep. Okay. Well, thank you for that. Moving on then to the next item on the agenda, which is uh, the January monitoring round. We have a uh, departmental briefing. Could I invite then formerly Andrew Hamilton and Stephen McMurray here, please? Um, and again, could just remind ourselves that the briefing had to be postponed from the 12th of December and that the uh, return to the AFP has already been made. And this is included in your, in your members' pack along with the, the briefing originally provided by the department. Um, so, without any further ado, could I just invite Andrew and Stephen to uh, take us maybe through this monitoring report? Okay. Uh, thank you very much, Chairman, and um, you, you know, you know uh, Stephen, who's been here many times before. Um, as you said, um, because of the uh, deferment of our original uh, scheduled date with you on this, we have put our submission to DFP. Um, that said, if you know if there's any messages that you want to send back, I'll make sure that the DFP are and made fully aware of them um, after today's session. There hasn't been very much change. Um, at all since uh, our previous submission to you, but I'll go through those and, and highlight where, where there, there have been changes. Um, the first, the first item really then is on capital and the, the reduced capital requirements of uh, 8.93 million. Um, the major part of that is the clawback of uh, funds that were previously given to Helm to take forward housing development in George's Street. That's been stuck really because of planning issues, and um, we've really like where where, um, where developments don't take place, which we, where we have provided funding for it, our rules provide for the clawback of the monies, and we've had to trigger that. So this is really an accounting issue. We've got to recognise that in our accounts. Um, so we've recognised that as a debtor in our accounts. The cash, we'll agree how the cash comes back to us with Helm, from Helm um, in a way that doesn't destabilise that organisation. But um, from an accounting point of view, there's an £8.1 million in our accounts now this year, which um, is a reduced requirement which we hand back to the AFB. Um, there's, a, there's a couple of other smaller um, capital items um, as well. Uh, housing Association grant receipts. Um, uh, there's 600,000 there, which is unutilised, and uh, we're, we're giving that back as well. In addition, and in addition to that, um, there's a small saving on a, 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 the capital costs of the systems for the private se rented sector registration, which is due to start shortly, of 230,000. Um, and that, that the total of those three items amounts to 8.93 million. Um, then on to the uh, reduced resource requirements. The committee has already, I think, uh, referenced the uh, plant maintenance issue. Um, there's the housing executive are in total um, declaring easements of 7.46 million. Five million of that is plant maintenance associated with the delay and the the fact that that issue hasn't been resolved. Um, the, the £1 million pounds is really savings on grass maintenance contracts, where they've got much more competitive prices than they anticipated. So there's a £1 million pounds there, and there's a £1 million pounds of additional interest, uh, which has been accumulating because money hasn't been spent. Um, and then in addition to that, uh, formally we've got to 
um, if you like, repeat the uh, easement that we had identified in October monitoring. It wasn't taken back at that particular time, because we were hopeful of utilising that in a buyback, um, uh, buyback of, of, of houses. Um, in the event, we couldn't make that work from an economic and value for money perspective. The business case didn't stand up, so the easement now is, is formally returned. Um, so that's, that, those are the, the, the main issues. There's, 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 there's some technical issues there where um, we need to move money into the proper budget, uh, proper budget line for the housing executive in terms of <coughs> benefit admin costs. That has traditionally been funded from other sources in the housing executive budget, and we just we're transferring the money, so there's no impact at all on, on spend. Um, there's a, then, there's a, a technical accounting issue about the reclassification of resources associated with um, IT. Um, we hold those resources in a, a revenue line, but the accounting standards require us to capitalise some of that and treat it as capital, so we need to reclassify the resource from uh, revenue to capital, 1.5 million. Um, the, uh, in, in one of our bids, I think earlier we, we, were, um, we had alluded to a non-cash issue associated with affordable home loans and empty home loans of 3.32 million. Um, that's a sort of a technical issue where um, we've got to reflect in our accounts the fair value of the loan, and it's an interest-free loan which is paid back over a number of years, so we have to take account of the time value of money, so the fair value of that is a lower amount. Um, and uh, that's 3.32 million, which is a cost. Now, when we put our submission in, we are assuming that that would be a cost that would fall on our Dell resort. But in fact, that's been clarified now, and it's going to be treated to Amy. So that bid falls away. We won't be we won't be submitting that bid. Um, and the final issue is a small non-cash requirement from the uh, Social Security Agency which is associated really with um, adjustments to depreciation and impairment uh, uh, costs associated with um, uh, a five-year review of the value of land and property that we're holding. So that's really just a technical issue as well. So that's, uh, you know, that's, uh, I've run through those quite quickly. Now you might want to raise some issues with us and we'd be happy to take any questions. Okay. Um, Andrew, a number of members obviously want to come in on this here, but... I mean, just three points I would make before I invite other members in. I mean, what we're actually been told this morning is that there is now £10 million formally been lost to the social housing programme, and a further £7 million lost to the maintenance scheme. So that's a total of £17 million. Now, that's on top of all the money which was lost to the social housing programme last year. It's adds up to, if I remember correctly. Something like 50, plus maybe 70. I may be wrong. So, I mean, you understand my point of view that a social housing programme and every member in this table mm -hmm. would represent constituents who are in need of homes and in need of homes repaired and maintained. And this is a further start of the year, and we're now told £17 million. I know this goes back to last year, but it just has to be absolutely and utterly unacceptable. The number of members coming in, Dolores. <coughs> Thank you, Chair, and just want to echo. I mean, I, I would fully anticipate coming to a DSD committee to hear that there's a requirement uh, for additional funds to be sought in a monitoring round, given the spiralling uh, waiting lists that there are for social housing and uh, for repairs and high levels of fuel poverty. And I think it's a, a, a damning indictment of the department and indeed the housing executive that here again, another monitoring round, we are uh, seeing the return of funds that are needed not only by people who are uh, suffering horrendous living conditions, but also a construction industry that continues to be depressed. So I would like uh, to know why exactly uh, this has happened and how uh, the department can stand over a uh, continued uh, return of money to DFP and why you have not been able to get your act together in, to, in ensuring uh, that this money is spent. Do you want me to deal with that now, I'm, I'm, I'm just I'm okay. conscious. I mean, there may be a number of people who want to ask a similar or the same okay. question. So, 
I'm happy, Chair Foon, to, to I understand, talk to you. I'm, I'm just wondering if we can we take a number of questions, but uh, look, just to answer, Andrew, I mean, we'll just take one member at a time, because members may want a variation of um, some of yeah, questions. Oh, okay. Could, just um, to be clear, what <coughs> we're handing back in terms of capital isn't associated with um, uh, social housing. It's, it's, it's the associate it with the clawback. There, we, we, we would have given money to Helm um, five or six years ago for a scheme, which hasn't taken place for planning uh, as a result of planning issues. That's that's the reason we're handing that money back. It's not associated with the social housing programme um, as now. What Sorry, Andrew, Chair, I don't accept that. Well, sorry. Well, sorry. That's, that's, I'm, I'm mm -hmm. just, let, let me just then say you know, something maybe which I didn't say to you before, which I should have done. Um, we, we are proposing using, utilising our resources the, you know, in the way that you actually suggested, you know, in that to make sure that the, the resources are used to address housing need. There are some easements in our system which we have recycled, and we're, what we are proposing to do is allocate a further £10 million to um, the uh, co-ownership scheme, and uh, the, the, where there is a huge demand there. But Andrew, sorry, it, it, what we're dealing with here is not the claw back to help from Helen. What we're dealing with here is the buyback, the £10 million proposed buyback scheme, which okay. we were notified here in October. Yes. Uh -huh. um, and we were given cost and assurances, if I remember correctly, because people were asking yeah. what areas were those, uh, you know, houses to be bought back in, with the areas of high demand, mm -hmm. need, and so on and so forth. So there was quite a lot of discussion and debate around that. Yes. And I've been told. That scheme can't go ahead, and that ten million pounds now returned. Yes, yeah, sorry, lost. I understand. That's that. lost. What, what you're saying. All right. Yes. It, it is right, but but you're also in relation to the clawback from Helm. There should be a plan B in relation to that. I mean, I would have thought there are already schemes throughout the north. I mean, if I take North Lurgan alone, there's 400 <coughs> people on on a housing waiting list in one tiny part of Lurgan, and you're telling me they had more money back. And with all due respect, and um, putting more money into affordable housing, how important that is. It's actually a lot of people want social housing, public housing. Yeah. Okay, so a minute, you've, you've okay, I, 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 I understand the point you're making. Yes, we had, we had hoped to be able to make the case to utilise that £10 million in a buyback scheme. We did our business case and we presented the arguments for it. And yes, it would have made you know it would have been a good use of the money. But when you when you stack it up really against whether it's an effective use of the money. Um, the, you know, our DFP colleagues would have taken a view that you could actually achieve, or you, you could you could actually deliver more social housing through the social housing development programme, where housing associations are raising part of the money privately rather than fully funded publicly. Under this scheme that we were proposing, we would have been financing 100% of the costs rather than 50% of the costs, and on that reason, for that reason. The um, the case fell, so and and that that that's simply we've we've got a responsibility here to deliver but, not but only Andrew, more housing. But the upshot of that, Andrew, then is that what you're saying, the DAP were saying, that won't stack up because it'd be better done by way of using housing associations. But the end result of this, the snapping use banner was been given back, so it's completely mm -hmm. lost. It's, well, it's it's not lost to the block. It's lost a house. It's lost a house. It's lost a house. Okay, so let's. I want to take members, Sammy and then Fran McCann and whoever else. Um, I mean, this is a recurring theme with DST um, and has been for the last number of years that coming up to the end of the year, monitoring rounds, money is given back um, and substantial sums of money are given back. And apart from, apart from the impact that it has on then what you do with the money and how you ensure that it's, it's not lost to the block and allocated to other spending. I mean, at this time of the year, and I think departments are told time and time again, if you're not going to spend money, give early notification, you're not going to spend money so that we don't get the huge amounts of money being um, uh, given back at the end of the year. What worries me in this is that we're going into discussions, and there's a paper later on about the next budget period, now, I've got to say, I think DSD are going to have a very, very difficult case to make when it comes to arguing for resources, additional resources, when, it, when we're looking at the 15-16 the, the budget, um, given the record that there is of underspends and inability to spend the resources which there are. And, you know, uh, leaving aside the detail of this, 
and just think of the politics of giving money back continually <coughs> and not being able to um, ensure that the resources that which have been allocated in the first place are spent doesn't strengthen your hand for budget negotiations and what's going to be a very tight budget round next time round. Can I just on the specifics? You see, on the the money which has come back from from hell, and maybe you could just clear, clarify this for me. They got this money to purchase the land. Presumably, it was purchased on the basis that um, that only the, the contract only signed if planning permission was granted. It was subject to planning permission, um, and the planning permission didn't come through. Now, given the fact that the planning problems around this site have been known for some time. How has it only come to light now that this would become uh, an issue of um, money having to be uh, surrendered? <coughs> Was the department not aware, or t knowing that there were planning problems for the last couple of years, was, had the, the planning not uh, the department not sought advice as to what hap uh, how this money, if the site could not be purchased, was to be treated? I, I think that's the first question. The second one is just on the the plan maintenance. And I mean, the figure we have here is seven million. Though I think Andrew, you had said five million. Maybe it just tells what what the right figure is. But. What are the contractual problems with, plan, with the planned maintenance uh, contract at present, which has um, meant that we're now surrendering five million or seven million, whatever it happens to be, um, on that? And the third question is just on the the buyback scheme. I actually asked the question the, at the, 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 the last time: Are we sure we could spend ten million pounds, given the length of time it takes to get? We well, hadn't even identified the houses at that time. Houses identified, contracts signed, all the conveyancing done, and everything else. Could we get it uh, all spent in this year? Because I was fairly sceptical uh, in September that we could actually do it. And the assurance was given, yes, we could. Now it appears there's something even more fundamental. And it's not even the logistics of getting the houses transferred. But before the money was bid for by the scheme, we hadn't even uh, put a business case um, that DFP uh, could could look at. Because what you're saying to me, um, and what you've said to the committee here this morning, seems to be um, a, 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 go a step back, i.e., is it good use of public money for 100% of the cost of a house to be paid for by the housing executive rather than build a new house where we're only paying 40% or whatever the, 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 the grant is. Now, surely that kind of issue must have been discussed with DFP before the bid was ever made. And why has it only come to light now? OK. Um, thanks. Uh, I'll deal with those three issues there. Um, with regard to Helm, um, yes, there's a judgment call as to when we would recognise that and, and trigger the clawback. And you know, I, I, you know, I see the legitimacy in your argument that we could have done it earlier. I suppose we were hoping that at some point those planning issues would have been resolved to the satisfaction of all parties and which would have allowed the, the project to go ahead. Um, but in the end, we've, we've taken the view now that we have to regularise this recognise that it's not going ahead and trigger the formal clawback. Um, the, the, um, sorry, Andrew, can I maybe yes, just add, just from, a, yeah. from a technical point, accounting point of view, it's really only really recognise it in the accounts when it's quite certain that the money would come back. So, so we couldn't actually recognise it in our accounts as a debtor and hence declare the money um, to DFP until accounting-wise we, there was certainty, a higher level of certainty, over the, the possibility of getting the money back. And when, when were Helm aware that there was absolutely no chance of planning permission being granted on the site? I'm not sure. I haven't, I haven't got that detail um, uh, with me, so we, we can... Yeah, yeah. Um, <clears throat> the, the, the position then on planned maintenance, the, the figures that I gave you are correct. The total easement that the... Um, the executive declared is seven million, but five million of that relates to the plant maintenance issue. The other two million are explained by um, savings, really, on grass maintenance contracts. 
and then because the money in plant maintenance is not being spent, cash has been accumulating in the bank accounts and generating more interest, so there's a million pounds of interest, which is um, the, 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 um, also being um, declared. With regard to just the plant maintenance issue, um, I think you know, where we are now, this, this has not been fully resolved yet, but I think the parties are getting closer. The meetings before Christmas, there's, um, further, there's a further meeting next week, and hopefully um, uh, there, there will be a position then, a mutually <coughs> satisfactory position, uh, really worked out at that point in time. The good news is, uh, and the reason, the reason that the money has not been spent is because the, the contracts have not been signed because of this issue, um, the new contracts, but now we've moved to a situation where they have the, the, the um, executive so have awarded, if you like, or appointed people to the framework. There is this standstill period of 14 days, which I, think ex uh, which I think expired at midnight last night, and subject to no appeals, um, then they would move forward to sign the new contracts. Um, uh, and then, so the work can start, it'll take a few months before that actually happens, but the work should start flowing, hopefully, in the new financial year. Um, and and, and there, as I said, there does seem to be a meeting of minds between the, the parties, and they're edging towards a resolution, really, of this, which <coughs> to the mutual satisfaction of both parties. That's where we are on, on that amendment. Um, the buyback scheme, yeah, um, we had say, you know, we, we, we had, when we looked at this, we thought this was a good way to use the money. Um, but once we did the deed, once we got into the detail of it and making the case for it, um, as I say, it, it fell on the grounds that it, on the value for money test. Um, there were issues about, and certainly we were challenging ourselves internally, the ability of the housing executive to deliver the totality of what they were saying. And we were moving towards, I suppose, in the final throws of this to a smaller scheme um, with, more, with, with any additional resource not utilised being allocated to the co-ownership scheme. That's where we were internally on it. But um, uh, in, in the event, the, the whole scheme fell because it failed the value for money test. Yeah, but, Andrew, I mean, the point I was making was that the issue which you have raised this morning about whether or not it is value for money to pay 100% of the cost of a house or get a housing association where we only grant aid, whatever it is, 40% of the... That's a fundamental issue that before you ever get down to the detail of what, what houses, where the, the, what kind of houses, where you're going to get them, who you're going to deal with, etc. That's a fundamental point you'd have thought before this ever came near the committee would have been dealt with the DFP. You're telling me, because it was never mentioned in September, yeah. um, the September it was all about the logistics of could you uh, identify the houses and then get the contract signed before the end of the year. Um, wh why was well, that, that fundamental issue? It never, never was raised with us. I mean, this is the first we're aware that that might have been an issue with the scheme. And when was it first raised with DFP? Well, that, was, that emerged from our discussions with DFP, but the, um, it's not to say there was, there's always two sides of the equation, so there are the costs and then there are the benefits. There, are, there were benefits associated with, if you like, the 100% buyback, you know, which it would have led to, uh, a, you know, in terms of environmental benefits for, you know, what you could have is, is a, a, an area or a, a housing estate, you know, blighted, if you like, by properties which were not properly maintained and all the rest of it. So the investment of public resource would have uh, produced benefits. At the end of the day, though, the, the judgment has to be taken whether those benefits are greater than the cost, whether, there's a, whether it's a positive outcome. And that, that, that's... With that's due respect, Dan, that was never ever the scheme because it was to be a purchase of houses in areas of high demand, mm -hmm. and I would doubt if you're going to find any areas of high demand where there was widespread blight, mm -hmm. and uh, it wasn't ever presented as a regeneration scheme. 
that was presented to he here as a way of dealing with housing shortages in house, uh, areas of high demand where the housing executive didn't have sufficient stock and housing associations didn't have any stock. So, you know, that's not an explanation as to why, you know, these things were balanced out. There's there seemed to be a fundamental flaw here. And all I'm saying is this. That had this money, had we known in September that this money wasn't going to be spent, and I, I'm actually a big supporter of, of co-ownership, but co-ownership could have probably steamed ahead far, far more in the intervening period rather than now trying to spend £10 million in the remaining couple of months of the year. We did, we just yep. thought, well, we did say to co-ownership that there was a good likelihood <laughs> more money coming through to allow them to have, to have done a bit of work. Um, in previous months. But you accept that throughout all of last year that uh, the co-ownership continuity were the beneficiaries of windfall? Mm -hmm. Because at the expense of housing need. The two different things, and I support co-ownership as well, no difficulty whatsoever. But we have repeatedly made it very clear that that's not addressing housing need. And it's too easy for the Department to come here and say, well, we'll have an easement, so we'll give it the co-ownership. That's not good enough. That is not meeting the need. And that's what has to be addressed by yourselves from a con. Sure. And I think that's a, a point was I've raised the question a number of times, and <coughs> I think that, uh, that co-ownership has a niche for itself within uh, the provision of houses. But let's face it, you talk about 1,200 applicants, 200 houses. Look at the other side, 20,000 people a year declare themselves homeless. Uh, but uh, 9,000 were accepted as homeless. Nothing has been done to deal with uh, the, the difficulties and problems that, that, that arises. Uh, that nothing has been said, well, we have this season, we have this additional money. Let's ensure uh, that it's put in the, 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 the build houses uh, that deal with the thing. And I think a relevant point <coughs> that I made is that there's nothing been done to deal with need. Uh, and, it, and, and, and it's been shipped uh, to say, but I think, I think it's, what I would like to know, see over this past. Uh, uh, several years, how much has been given to co ownership in total, including uh, additional monies or grant uh, to, 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 to build houses? Uh, not sure off the top of my head. I mean, I think there are budgets in the region the, of the 10, 15 million. The budget was 25 million, and that's been increased by 15, I think, this year. So 40 it's 40 million, 40, 40 million, million. 40 million the, the, this year. The point year. I would make in this is it's not a question of either or. Um, the, uh, we, we have our programme for government target. Um, for social housing, and that is going to be met. That's a minimal. That's a minimal. Mm -hmm. that, that is going to be met. And where, the, where we can, we pump prime the, the sector. So we, we facilitate the advanced land purchases and all the rest of it, so that the, the housing can go forward. You know, there is a gestation period here. You can't just turn it on like that. It takes some 18 months to two years from the, the start <laughs> to the finish. And, the rest of it, but we do recognise. Like, I'm, 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 we do recognise the point, point that you're that making. Like, that that's important for us to say that um, we want to see more social housing. We know that we're falling to the <coughs> needs, and uh, and we're doing what we can to address that. Okay, um, Jim Mallister. Oh, sorry for that. Sure, the, 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 there was just a, a couple of, and Sammy had uh, raised uh, some of it, and uh, the centre around plan plan maintenance. You know, there are people who live in houses that are in dire need of, uh, of, of maintenance programmes at O'Head. Now, time after time, we have been told here uh, that uh, we're coming close uh, to, to, to getting a solution to it. And it doesn't seem to be any, uh, any closer. As a matter of fact, I think it had been or somebody a couple of months ago who had actually raised the whole question of the amount of money uh, or the, 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 when somebody applies for a contact. That they're going in 30 per cent on it just to try and get a contract. We were told that we were reaching uh, a position where that, that, that was going to be cleared away. Uh, and it doesn't seem to be that, that we're any closer to uh, being able to uh, resolve that matter. Well, I, 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 I think that there has been a you know, step forward you know, just, um, in the last month or so. Um, we have got to a position where contractors have been appointed to the framework and subject to no appeals under the um, standstill period, which I think expired at midnight, then those contracts will now go forward um, and work can start to be planned, probably will start early in the new year. Now, um, uh, like you, um, the Minister in the Department is um, you know, finds the, the total easements that have been declared on plan, uh, plan maintenance not to be acceptable. 
hopefully it's picking up uh, Sammy's point, uh, that has contributed very significantly to the level of easements in this financial year. It's hopefully a one-off and won't happen again. Um, the, uh, and the, the final point, Fran, is my understanding is that the parties are edging towards, um, probably edging is an understatement, moving towards a resolved position on this to the mutual satisfaction of both parties. And there's a meeting scheduled next Thursday, I think, which hopefully will resolve the issue. Or just to one final point. <clears throat> oh, no, it used to be at this committee, it used to come in, and uh, that, uh, that when you were getting a report, uh, especially on monitoring rents, that uh, it was usually for money to be, uh, to be added to uh, the social housing um, development programme, that a minister had applied for an extra 10 million, 15 million. It seems to be the complete opposite now, and that we're going on a downward spiral. Uh, and dealing with it. when you speak about the program for them, it's minimal targets. You know, it's uh, what, what you what you, you look at is built way above that to ensure that you deal with the continuous problem of increased waiting lists, people in hostels, people in lower credit conditions. But that that's that's not the case. You know, you seem to be fight on a fire fight uh, to, to, to give back money and shift it across uh, the the schemes that will deal with the minimal amount of people. Well. We're coming now to the 15-16 budget, and you know, hopefully, then we'll be able to recognise the that the deed, and that the committee will support bids. I have to say, see, see me going out to say the Sunday it's in the hostel for years. Don't worry about it. In the 15-16 budgets, we'll deal with your problem. Or somebody it's in overcrowded condition, you can't do that. Uh, we seem to be focused, obviously, on uh, on ownership. But did, does the department ever sit down and say, well, let's see how we can increase uh, the amount of social uh, uh, houses that are available. Let's see how we can deal with uh, the serious problem of housing need. Do you want to, Steve? Yeah, just, Fran, just, just to say that the, the, the target for next year is, and it shows a, a step change from this year. So we'll be coming to you talking about the targets for next year. Uh, Jim Allister. I want to take you back to the Helm Clawback. 8.1 million. Is that the total of what they'd been, what they had received? Yes, that's my understanding. Yeah. And they'd had that for five or six years. Yes. Have they spent it? Um, not on that scheme. <laughs> yes, but have they spent it elsewhere? Well, there was an initial purchase price for the site itself, yeah. uh, which is now worth considerably less than the, the amount that was paid. So how are they going to pay you back eight point one million pounds? Well, that's that's we're in discussions about how we actually get the cash back. And we want so is this just a paper exercise? Counting issue. We've got to recognise, and we've discussed this with our auditors. Uh, we've got to recognise the clawback of the total amount. You know, at the time we, you know, it's, it, we recognise <coughs> that, that 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 decision has been taken. So much are you expecting to get back? We'll get back. We will get back 8.1 million. When? Over time, we're going What's to over time, yeah. we're, well, we're we're going to agree that with Helm. That we're in the process of discussing that. One year, ten years? I haven't, I haven't, we haven't, we haven't decided that. I think yeah. two to three years is the was the last estimate. Two to three years. Is it coming back with interest? Um, uh, we we will uh, we will agree all of that with Helm, you know, as part of a negotiation. So to come to this committee and tell us we're calling back eight point one million pounds might create the impression to the public out there that the public coffers are now going to be swelled by eight point one million pounds. In fact they're not. No, well in, you know what we the basis of our accounts are resource accounts. That reflects a debtor and that is additional spending power to the Northern Ireland Executive. Even though we haven't got it, well, we we have the spending power. We have the spending power. You're 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 referencing a cash flow. The spending power is there. That is available to the block. Available to the block in circumstances where it hasn't been and won't for two to three years be recovered. That is correct. It's available to the block. 
Helms or something. Okay, I intervene there, Tim, just in, in support of your kind of line here, because I remember correctly we were given an explanation that the eight million, whatever the money, the clawback money from Helm, would be done by way of uh, the day would, for talks sake, build a number of houses for which we get no money. That would come off the eight million pound. There'll be other, in other words, it wouldn't be a, a, a paper transaction. There will be a reality of an eight million pound at our disposal to yes. build and provide homes. You will vary that with Helen, but, but at the end of the day, there will be more houses provided <laughs> and through that eight million pounds. Ben, that's the, that's, we will get the value but of the eight points. There seem to be more right? suggestions more than an accountancy matter here, and what confuses me, because I, mean, I want to be told that Helen will, in kind, pay back the eight million pound by virtue of building houses. Yeah, that the, case? You know, the, the detail of the negotiation, you know, I, haven't, I haven't got here, but yes, Helen will provide. Eight point one million pounds of value um, to whether in cash or in kind, and I, I just I haven't got the detail of how that split is. Uh, well, would it not be important to the department to know whether it is in cash or in kind? That, that's the point. You know, yes, we, we are in active negotiations. Not me personally, but we are in active negotiations with Helm about For how long? Um, do you, would you like us to just maybe to resolve the detail of this? I, I can give you a written note, uh, chair, on, on the detail of, of this well, uh, time scales. I, mean, I think we need something. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I mean, I think at, in January 2014, I think we're entitled to have an interview <laughs> because, I mean, you're not even in a position to tell us that you're in discussion. Well, I think you, are, you just said you're in discussion with Helen. At what point are those discussions that open? I'd like the discussions around the contractor and around the plant maintenance because we keep been told they're not moving on. They're really closed. But two weeks ago, they were more or less done, does it? Now they're edging or they're moving. I'm not sure where that's at at the minute. So uh, I think I'd want a bit more certainty around this issue around the clawback from Helen. Uh, and I think the committee, as Jim has already said, is entitled to have that information. And we would expect to have that. Yeah, I'm happy to provide that. Okay. Maybe, maybe when you're providing that, Andrew, you can let us know. What reserves do Helm have at present? Because I mean, one of the issues in the past has always been that housing associations have been sitting on huge cash reserves, which they say they need for various purposes, <coughs> but never seem to spend. Um, we interested to see whether the reserves cover the money which is owed could be used. So maybe you could let us know that. Mm -hmm. no yeah. Okay. Fair enough. Uh, I'll have Stuart and then okay. Just continuing on on the Helen question, I, I appreciate the complexities of public sector finance, but one might have thought that they would have never had their hands on the £8.1 million given that there was no planning permission given and that it was money that was being allocated for the purchase of land and the development of a housing scheme that never happened. So why was the money transferred to them at all, other than to add to the coffers which you know, Sammy has indicated that many housing associations have. Uh, and while I can see the benefits of that style of financing, it, it, it does lead to these sort of risks. The other thing is, Helm, I understand, recently have indicated uh, publicly that they intend to merge with other housing associations. What effect will that have on their, their financial situation, and, and how will that fit with these negotiations as well? Um, okay, we're getting in your, we're, <laughs> you're testing my knowledge of this, uh, Stuart, and I think I can address those points in the written submission. Um, um, in terms of, but the, there, there is a, um, uh, we we do have rules, and you know, in, in terms of the provision of finance to housing associations, trigger points at which money passes. And um, what, this would have what happened. What possible trigger points could have well, been met been when no planning permission was ever gained? Presumably, one, the key trigger point would have been planning permission granted, uh, transfer X million pounds. Yeah, and you purchase just give it, of land. Did you just get it all in one lump? Um, one check, 8.1 million pounds. There would have been, there would have been a, a scheme and a, you know, approval process which would have been followed, which apply to all of our. Um, uh, uh, dealings with housing associations, but, but we'll cover we'll cover that point. Can we get a timeline on that? Uh -huh. and uh, we'll, we'll, we'll give you the full details of it um, so that you have it. Um, the uh, the issue of the merger is a matter for Helm. It won't impact on our negotiations. Mm. There was also chair that, that was reviewed by Northern Ireland Audit Office, and there was a report issued with the details of it as well. So 
Going back to the to the uh, the buyback scheme, was that piloted either in Northern Ireland or in, elsewhere in the United Kingdom? My my memory is that it had been piloted elsewhere. Uh, so, if it works elsewhere, or maybe didn't work elsewhere, why weren't we alerted to this? I, did, uh, I, th I think I did hear something of of there was some other pilot schemes, but they were done in a different context by local authorities and uh, and a different. You know, it wasn't comparing like with like. Could it not, I mean, in general, how could you not be comparing like with like local authority, housing executive, sum of money, to buy back properties, uh, and they. Just housing associations operating in the same. Well, they, they don't actually, because they, 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 the grant for housing associations is even less, so the yes. value for money case would be bigger here than it would yes. be in other parts of the United Kingdom. But, but, you know, I, 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 again, I understand the, the, the business case argument and, and the financial arguments of 100% funding versus um, a grant to a housing association and them. Using other funds to, to, to build properties, but you know, my knowledge, my constituency is that there are many ex-housing executive properties sitting currently for sale in the forty to fifty thousand pound range. How much does it actually cost to build a house? Um, even if the grant is at forty percent, I, I would have thought you're rubbing alongside many of the figures that are the reality for people that have their properties up for sale. Many of them, many of them, the very uh, landlords that we're talking about, people who aren't actually maintaining property very well. But we also have the point of part of the scheme was designed to actually deal with pressure points in, in, in the housing market. So I, I am concerned that, that, that this, this, this has come off the rails. It, it had the potential to deliver. Um, a range of things which would have benefited social housing. It did. It was, it was quite an 11th, 11th hour thing that came up in the last monitoring round. It was only when the final, sort of final business case came through and we saw all the detail of it that um, it didn't stack up from overall value from any point of view. Well, who stopped it? Um, well, um, we, we would have put our case to DFP. <laughs> But, um, and DFP would have taken a view that the case didn't stack up. So it's a corporate government um, decision not to proceed. Chair, but, but sorry, DFP, I'm sorry. Sammy makes the point that DFP sh should have had the business case. If DFP didn't get the business case, why did they release the money in the first place at all? No, no, what happened here was, the, as opposed to us surrendering the money, and then formally surrendering the money in the last round, uh, it was more time was bought, if you like, to consider, take a full sort of consideration of the case. So um, it was our intention one time to surrender the money um, in the last round, but um, the decision was taken, well, we'll give you more time to present a, a business case on this latest thinking. But the difficulty that we have here is that three months later, yeah. Yeah. that's three months more time you actually had, and you still have no further ideas about what to do about it. So just on a particular point in terms of making those assessments, given the uh, link between poor mean? health outcomes and poor housing, mm -hmm. uh, is there no uh, constants or assessment made uh, within a business case of the impact of, uh, on inter intergovernmental targets you know, in terms of improving health outcomes for people uh, by the provision of good housing? And therefore, that should have had uh, a consideration in terms of a benefit and whether or not those houses were value for money. Yeah, I'd, uh, except the point you're making, you know, in terms of identifying the wider benefits. Um, but the answer is no. I, I, to be honest, I'm not sure of the detail and on you know what what, what specific benefits associated with that uh, initiative, whether it included health benefits or not. Sure, maybe we could find out okay. whether or not. No, fair enough. Uh, Fra, I have Maggie okay. to commend first, but just as, just on the on the back, I suppose. Uh, 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 um, it's be interesting to find out how the houses, the housing executive houses, were identified. Were they be uh, bought from the open market houses already for sale? Because there already was a mechanism there for housing associations uh, to, 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 to buy houses on the open market uh, to, to to fill out uh, the social housing, housing development program. Why was that never considered? Because I think it probably have the most advantageous. Uh, uh, financial thing at the present time, if you were to buy houses on the open market and allocate them. And I think there still is a provision there for the Department to clear houses to be bought in that manner. Um, 
Yeah, well, the, I know the housing executive were going through a process of identifying the properties that could be purchased within the time frame. Other than that, Fran, um, uh, uh, detail. Rather, what it was that we are encouraging the housing association right. scheme that does exist at the minute, um, mm -hmm. and that was that formed a part of it, albeit a small part of this. But, but part of their point of view was, um, in terms of economy, the scale of maintaining houses. If there are a spread, it's very difficult for them to do that. They could keep them in a sort of compact group that makes economies of scale in terms of maintaining. But if you're, if you're getting a house now in summer, it's for 50 or 60 grand. The some years that it's far less than what you would do to, to put in the, 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 the build a house. Yeah. And a lot of them are as of high demand, surely. Uh, that would have been taken into consideration. Uh, given, it, given it that the head of the market, the housing association, were paying two hundred thousand yeah, yeah, yeah. houses. I say we are encouraging housing mm -hmm. associations mm -hmm. to do that. <coughs> Those yeah. within the grand but, scheme. But they told there was ten million available for them to, to, to do that. Yeah, that, that they weren't able to utilise. They, so they were told that there was ten million, <laughs> and they, they weren't able to use that to, 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 to buy houses. Um, they were able to utilise whatever they could of it. I think it was one or two million. Okay, Maggie Brady. Yeah, it was just about maintenance in general because you've said that if the um, contracts are sorted out, hopefully soon, that plan maintenance will gain property in uh, the new financial year. The difficulty, I think, for some tenants, or quite a few of them that I'm coming across at the moment, is day to day maintenance. I had a case last week where somebody had applied about two and a half months ago to have an outside door repaired. It wasn't done, and because of the flooding last week, the house was badly affected. <coughs> and it seems to be when you contact the local office, they are saying, well, there's a lack of maintenance of the building in terms of finances and people being uh, in a position to do it because obviously it's done now not by direct labour but by contractors. So there seems to be a difficulty with that. And while plan maintenance is a different issue in terms of long term and schemes in certain areas, it seems to me that the day to day maintenance for situations in the race has been completely ignored and forgotten. Yeah. Well, um, I'm happy to, to take that back, uh, Mickey, you know, and if you have got the details, you know, I'd be happy to take that case to the housing executive. Okay, okay can I, I just make a couple of points uh, that no other members indicated? Um, if I recall, at some point earlier last year, yeah. some point earlier last year, we had what I would describe a difference of opinion between the Housing Association movement and the department and the Housing Executive in relation to what may be barriers preventing the Housing Associations uh, moving ahead with uh, other <coughs> housing schemes. I remember correctly, and I will stand correctly if needs be, the senior department officials were meeting with the Housing Association movement leadership, if I remember correctly, probably on a monthly basis to look at and explore these barriers with the view to having these various barriers, which was everything from planning decisions to procurement and all the rest of that removed. Uh, that was some point earlier last year that we had a presentation to that effect here. Because this committee has been routinely raising this matter, this problem about, uh, I think as Fran McCann says, in previous times we would have had, in all of the monitoring rounds, uh, for bids uh, for further money to win the social housing programme, and that now is, has been in the complete reverse in that we are now handing money back. So at the start of the year we are handing money back and again I think it was more than £10 million. But that's, that's lost the social housing uh, programme. We also have, uh, and nothing said here this morning has indicated any different, uh, in the report by this committee this morning that the contract of decision around our plan maintenance not yet resolved. You are saying it is very close to being resolved. But that means that it will be uh, very likely Unlikely that there will be significant spend in this area for the remainder of the year. So that's seven million pound lost to the social housing programme by way of maintenance. So we're starting off in January 2014 with 17 million pound gone out of the housing social housing budget. Not acceptable. And I've heard nothing here. This mum gave me any encouragement whatsoever. Um, so therefore, it is a matter of which we're going to, I think, uh, as a committee, formally discuss because. I don't want to be here any more discussions around. We're doing monthly meetings, we're doing liaison meetings, we're doing this, that, and the other thing. The bottom line is we're not meeting housing needs, and uh, we're hot money back. And I think Sammy Wilson makes a point that if you were a finance minister and you were looking at the record as department in the past year or more in regard to the social housing programme, you're saying, well, you obviously don't need it because you can't spend it. And if you're not spending it and there's no outcome, <coughs> then what's the problem? 
So I just think that uh, certainly as a, a, a representative, with every other representative around the table who uh, have uh, serious pressure in each of our constituencies around people needing uh, social uh, housing and repairs being carried out, uh, that's just not a, a situation which is tolerable any longer. But I want to make it very, very clear, and I want this committee will discuss this formally, and it needs people to discuss it in closed session, uh, because we want to get the bottom of this. Okay, so if that's the case, <coughs> you're happy enough on to at the moment, Stephen, that uh, we leave that for this morning, and look, this committee will return this matter. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Okay, members, moving on to the uh, the inquiry. Um, as members will recall, um, that the committee had agreed to take evidence today from Stephen Brimstone, Michael Sands, and Barbara McConaughey. Uh, Michael Sands is, uh, we understand, unable to get tension <coughs> today due to illness, and there's a letter to that effect on page 8 of the members' uh, table items. We also have uh, the permanent secretary, Will Hare, Will Hare, here this morning, uh, and Will is here this morning, obviously not as a witness to the inquiry, clearly, but obviously is here specifically in respect to how this committee, this inquiry, will uh, receive the documentation that we require uh, to allow us to do our work. And just to remind people, we have raised on a number of occasions that uh, due to and I have to say, from my experience at this moment in time, more from the due diligence of this, the members here and officials, we have continued to discover that we have not received all the documentation that we were expecting and should have had. And I have to say, if I was been cynical, I would say it's nearly like a don't ask, don't tell. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't accept that uh, there's been information at the disposal of the department which has not been given to us other than we discovered that it was there. Uh, Jim Allister and myself, at least in one meeting, is the fact that uh, we had no, no, for example, no email correspondence provided to us. We had to ask that. In this day and age, to uh, expect uh, a, an inquiry of this uh, standing, to have to go and ask for email correspondence, it's just not good enough. Uh, we pointed that out at the time. We did acknowledge, and I made it very clear, that this is kind of new territory. It's a first off this type of an inquiry, so with a certain amount of latitude and experience and lessons to be learned. Uh, we have dealt with this matter on a number of cases, and I think I use the term that uh, you know, failure to disclose information for me would be, I would take that as a failure to disclose, and a, a very serious matter. I do want to acknowledge, Will, that yourself and maybe other officials have met with our committee officials in recent uh, days to work out how best to provide the relevant documentation uh, to this committee to enable us to do our statutory uh, duty, uh, and, and I do appreciate that. But I just want to give a couple of examples, just by way of addressing this, before we'll ask you to uh, speak to this. Chairman, see, see just before, because uh, I wasn't at the last meeting, so um, I, I may have, I may be wrong here, but there is another issue which Will has, it was involved in, and that is in the single tender action uh, decision by Mr. Hoodless uh, around the appointment of Campbell Tegel. Um, can, he, can we ask questions about that today? Well, what I, would, what I would actually prefer is that since we dealt with this matter early on, and some of that would be subject to not that particular issue, but it could be related to it, uh, we, we're going to take legal advice next week. So can I suggest that we would actually deal with that next week um, formally? It's just, it's just why Will was here. I mean, it's, and it really isn't around the process, but I just wanted to clarify, that, that given that what you've said about why um, he's here today, yeah. This is an issue which it might be useful just to explore rather than have to bring them back on. You know? Well, it, it may well be that we need a number of people back on that matter, Tommy. We are, we are in, in inquiry session at the moment, so I would prefer if we left that to deal with the totality of it and appreciate the point you're making. Um, so, uh, again, I don't want to be kind of mixing, mixing the, uh, the agenda items, if you don't mind, um, because the right <coughs> it needs uh, a proper attention. So I just wanted to make the point, well, that... Uh, as I've said, uh, I gave an example early on about the email stuff. Um, but we, we had, for example, uh, a number of people have rested their case around the record of the meeting on the 16th of April. Uh, a number of people have referenced this, both in terms of to spotlight programmes, to the assembly, to this committee, referring to the record of the meeting on the 16th of April. Yeah. And then, subsequent to us doing our work, we discovered that there were four iterations of that record of that meeting. We subsequently discovered there are actually six, now albeit 
<clears throat> one or two of them, which may not be major substantive changes at all. But the fact of the matter is that people were relying on what they refer to as the record of a meeting, but in actual fact the record changed through six iterations. Now, for me that's a very, very important issue to highlight here because that department, your department was obviously aware at some point that there was more than one record of a meeting, certainly more than one version of it. Mm -hmm. I'll come to that in a moment and we certainly will deal with it later on when we have uh, Ms McConaughey here to give her evidence. Um, but we also didn't discover, for example, that uh, we weren't told that there was a briefing provided to the Minister for the meeting on the 16th of April. Even though we had the Highness Agro officials here who said that they had been invited to that meeting on the 16th of April, but unusually they had not been asked to provide a briefing. Now, for me, what I want to know is that's two examples of where I believe the Department has been remiss. We also had evidence written and provided to the committee by Barbara McConaughey, which seemed to conflict with what, well, it didn't seem to, it does conflict with what was provided in evidence by Michael Sands. Now, the Department this week has provided this inquiry with a table which shows, contrary to what Mr Sands has said, that he did amend, according to the table that we have presented to us, that he did amend the document, the Aid Memoir, Stoke Minute, twice. At what point were we going to be advised of that? Because if the Department had that information, at what point was that Department going to actually indicate to this inquiry that what, what, he, what, what we had been hearing in evidence was actually incorrect? Mm -hmm. Um, so I think that these run very, very serious to the heart of uh, the ability of this inquiry to do its work. Uh, the further point I want to ask you, and I made this very clear to the Minister at the last when he was here giving his own evidence, this is absolutely nothing uh, personal or, or, or uh, disrespectful to the Minister, and the Minister, in my view, seemed to clearly accept that. Um, but we have a situation where people from the Department before they provide evidence to this inquiry, refer that evidence to the Minister. Mm -hmm. Now that puts the Minister in a very invidious position, never mind this inquiry. Because we have a Minister against whom allegations have been made. Mm -hmm. And that Minister is then expected to take evidence, to be presented to this inquiry from people who are going to give the evidence. So what role could the Minister possibly want to have in that, or should have? So but what we want to establish from yourself, Will, is you as the Permanent Secretary of this Department, and the, uh, the accounting officer, what steps are being taken under your leadership to ensure that this inquiry gets all of the relevant documentation in due course and in, in, a, in a timely fashion? Okay, absolutely. Um, fine. Well, look, thank you very much, Chairman. It, um, I mean, it was only uh, uh, just at the, the, the end of last meeting I realised that there were these problems occurring at this time. It only had, I mean, I had. Uh, uh, of this nature, and I, want, I mean, I want to make first of all very clear. I mean, you have total assurance. I want to make sure that you get all the documentation you want in a timely fashion. And I realise there are issues here. As you say, this has been a sort of learning experience for us all, uh, for the clerks, and, and for ourselves in the process. Uh, I mean, I suppose our main experience of this sort of inquiry is, is when, of course, we have the teams for the NAO who prepare the material for the PAC, and they do all the, the devilling, making sure all the documents are there in the right place for the committee and presentation of that issue. And in a sense, the way you're running your inquiry has been slightly different. Um, and uh, so it has been a learning experience, and I think looking at us and having our discussions with uh, your team and with my team, I think we're clearly... <coughs> Uh, you know, I can, I can identify some of the problems. I think that you've done, the approach you've taken is you've sent us very formal notes from the clerk with notes of minutes, uh, of what documents you want. And uh, may I say, it's not, uh, it's sometimes there's two elements here. Uh, we don't sit with a nice set of documents all sitting there neat, nice and neatly. It's a large department. You asked, for example, all our contacts with Turkington, so we had to go and ask every different unit of work and to look into each of their electronic records to see whether they had any reference to Turkington. 
it's a large bit of work to do. And it also depends on, you know, did they put the, the right title on the document so that they would know the right person? So that takes a bit of time. But that, that, that is one element, and that's, you know, that's our job is to get the documents. I'm just saying sometimes it does take a lot of time. That's some of the time and problems, I think, have come from that. But the second thing I think the issue is I think we've taken, uh, in the past, in our first phase, we probably we made a mistake. We, we, uh, we looked at your notes formally, we, and we diligently answered the exam question you set us quite precisely, and I think overly precisely. And I don't think that worked for you, and what didn't work for us, and you know, it, it, it's, it's prolonged this, this phase of the discussion. So, uh, you know, uh, one might, I mean, I'd say my teams, I think, have worked very hard on this issue. Uh, looking back on phase one, I think it would be much better if your clerk's team and myself had come early on and with the sort of issues and we had talked with them about the documents, had shown the documents <coughs> and to see how much further they wanted, including, for example, the iterations of these trim documents. Because actually, I mean, documents are frequently changed uh, in our system until they're finalised. That's the nature of the trim system. And you can see that that's happened and you can see the records and now you've got all the records there. That's the, what I, I on ch Tuesday, uh, when, when we met, we had a really good discussion this evening with, with your team. What I was, we've set up a, uh, we'll say a meeting next week for phase two. We'll talk about the broad set of documents, because phase two is so massive. I mean, it is a really big bit of task of work here. Uh, for you. There's, there's vast amounts of documentation here. Uh, there's some quite good analytical reports, which I think will help your committee in that process. And we can be, including the work of the, 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 the PAC, etc. But there's some bits we can pull that together. But what I was suggesting uh, to, uh, to Kevin and Claire would be that we would sit down with them, show the product, get the guidance from them, getting the documents to them, and then as they start reading through, if there's other connections, we can connect together to build up a full dossier for you. Um, and I think we should do that. We should meet regularly. And I will certainly. Make sure I chair that to make sure that that is all done, um, and uh, we will work that through. And we'll just make so we're sort of producing a, a new protocol just of how these documents are, are made. Um, and once we've done, got through, and got your the documents for phase two, uh, we obviously move on to the phase three documents and, and do the same issues, so we can get all the, these materials. But I think it's said because we have been getting our notes and our letters from you, and we've been answering the, the exam question as we understood it. And it was, that clearly doesn't work for you. And I think, you know, I think we can produce a better system, which is more open. So in a sense, as you start your in phase of inquiry, you've got the full set of inquiry uh, of papers as far as we can. There will always be bits of issues which will come up in discussion you'll ask for further material, and we'll get that for you uh, as you as you go on. So, I mean, I hope that gives you a sense that, you know, I, th I think we have learned in the process. And, you know, I think it's a joint learning for the clerks and ourselves and how we get that. And I hope that will work for us in, in the way forward. You talked about the question of fact, you know, that um, the pa all papers coming to the committee come are noted by the minister. Uh, that, that's the protocol between the executive and, and the assembly, which basically uh, all of us uh, operate. And, you know, um, Sammy, I suppose, as minister, you will recognise this issue. Now, may I say, we put that, those issues to note to the minister, only to purely to note. Um, and. You know, that's, uh, uh, and may I say, I see the Minister has never, there's no query about that issue, papers come to you. But that's the protocol I'm working under, in which, in a sense, the Executive and the Assembly has agreed to work under. Now, I can understand you're saying in this particular circumstance, you think there's a particular issue around this. I'm just saying, I'm working on the rules which we were set, because, in a sense, of course, the, the Minister is, is the, he's the head of the department, he's, uh, and representing the department, he has to understand what the department is, is saying, and, and we, we work to the minister because he is accountable to you, and we are accountable to him. And, and so it's this, in the nature of public servants, that, that's what the protocol was trying to recognise. Um, but I say, it, 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 when you, this committee is asking issues of the minister, um, it, these are issues which maybe, you, you know, as a committee you may want to reflect on, and the assembly may want to reflect in the future, but those are the rules. But uh, as I understand them, no, that's fair enough. And I mean, I'm, I'm not suggesting for one second, nor is there any evidence to suggest otherwise, that the minister has in any way wished to interfere in any of that. And, yeah, no. But I, I do recall the minister did seem to accept 
quite clearly that uh, the concept of the minister against whom an allegation has been made, it actually puts the minister in a very difficult position. So, yeah. if I remember correctly, there was evidence been presented to this committee which took two or three weeks before it came here because we were then told it had to go to the minister. Now, yeah. there, that's a, you leave yourself open to a conflict of interest allegation. Mm. So, what you need to do is to go away and speak to the minister and whoever else I would suggest to work out that there is absolutely no suggestion, or can be no suggestion, or open to suggestion that there is any conflict of interest. So that's because this is, this is. I mean, I don't accept your characterisation early on that this committee has done something different. This is an inquiry, which is set up under statute. Mm. So this is not a committee informal hearing. This is an actual legally based yeah. inquiry, mm. and we're doing it. We're doing our work strictly to the letter of the law. But, so everybody's clearly understanding on that. So there can be no kind of corners cut here, or. No, I'm, 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 no, Chair, I'm Chairman, but I, mean, I just want to establish from Wilkin Meath, he has made an important point, and that I can see this from both sides. Very few officials would be very happy about sending stuff out from a department with, and especially, in fact, maybe because of the sensitive nature of it, <coughs> without um, having notified the minister mm. first of all, and, and indeed. It, it, it probably will put um, officials in far, far more uh, put officials in, in far more difficulty if they were not to send papers <coughs> through the normal channels that there were uh, established for communications between the department and committees. And you know, I, I don't know that as a committee we can overrule the protocols which have been set down. And indeed, I suspect that very few officials within departments will be happy to be placed in a position where they made the decision about what goes to a committee, especially if it actually does involve the minister. Yeah. Well, I mean, uh, I'm, I'm not at all suggesting that this committee or this inquiry, because I want to make it clear this is an inquiry we're in session on, um, wants to overturn or, 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 or <coughs> thwart any uh, Protocols, but we need to establish that there's no interference with any information or evidence yeah. been presented to this inquiry, and that's obviously has to be yeah. uh, very absolutely sacrosanct. I want to return that. If a couple of members want to come in, Jim and then the rest. Yeah, I, just, just picking up on that point about the minister must be kept informed. He's the head of the department, etc. Mm -hmm. Is there a reciprocal dimension to that in respect of you as head of the uh, as permanent secretary? Um, are you kept abreast of meetings the ministers having, um, the content of those meetings, or does the minister act in a silo in that regard? Sorry, um, the minister's political meetings, which are not, to do, you know, uh, sorry. I'm not talking about his political uh, meetings. But um, uh, there is no, I mean, there's no, there's no protocol between. I mean, there's communications, as I say, between. But I know of no protocol or issue. But, so, for example, uh, at the heart of this phase of the inquiry is the meeting uh, that he had with Turkington's. Uh, you had knowledge of that meeting before it happened? Uh, yeah. Sorry, I can presume that uh, I will. I look at the minister's diary every week just to, you know, just to make sure, partly just to, to, so that I understand what is, is going on. I will, I will see the minister's diary. Um, uh, uh, and that's how you gain your knowledge? Uh, yes. Uh, I mean, uh, sorry. I also see submissions going through as well. Yes, I, 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 and in this case, you saw you saw the pre-meeting uh, yeah, briefing. Jim, yeah, just uh, I'm sorry. I, I mean, what I needed to just address here is a question of this legal uh, procedural uh, fairness. As you know, we because <coughs> Will Herod met here this morning as a witness to the inquiry because under the legal advice we've been very clearly given here and presented with around this whole question of procedural fairness. If we are inviting someone here uh, under uh, the terms of the inquiry to answer questions to the inquiry, then obviously we have to give them notice of that, yeah. so that there's no surprises and, and people have. So, what I have to say here, I have to rule that out for, for, for this morning because Will was invited here directly to address the issue of how he, as a permanent secretary <coughs> uh, responsible for the department, going to make sure that this committee is provided with all the relevant information that we're entitled to have. So that's on the, on the legal advice. So uh, I, I want to just make sure that we don't stray into evidence. Well, uh, just uh, I would say, <coughs> accept what you say, but 
you know, point six in our agenda is inquiry and delegations arising from the spotlight program in attendance, Mr. Will Hare, yep. which is very suggestive to me that he's here under the aegis of the inquiry. No, we, we, we very specifically, Jim, uh, made it clear that we were inviting him here uh, to deal with the <coughs> issue of provision of materials to the inquiry. So it's would obviously it, related to the inquiry, but not as a witness. Sure. Or would it be a way forward to um, indicate to Mr. Hare that if he feels uncomfortable <coughs> answering any of the questions, he needn't, because he has not noticed, but he is here. He might have useful information to give. Do we not take well, the opportunity? I think, well, we have established the, the procedure by which we're working the inquiry and in the interest of consistency and in the interest of making sure we would never at any point be accused by any witness that they were you know, uh, misled before they came here. <coughs> but we'll not do that. Uh, I mean, obviously, if we feel the need to bring uh, Will Hare here as a witness, then obviously the committee will do that, and we'll be well aware of that, as, as indeed as any other official. So, Jim, if you don't mind, uh, we'll, not, we'll actually not do that, because that means that we're keeping ourselves right and we're keeping all risks to a minimum and we're treating people professionally and fairly. Well, uh, the day. only other issue I was wanting to raise, and you can tell me whether it's in order or not, since the Permanent Secretary is here, I wanted to get a better understanding of the role of a special advisor within the department and how they sit in terms of their powers, their access to people and papers, their power to give directions. Is that within the ambit? I think we're and dangerous strain into. Um, I'm not. I'm not as wedded to the initial advice they gave on this particular question. If Will is content to do that, well and good. I would prefer actually that we would deal with that on another occasion. But I mean, I can see the point that you're making. So, you know, I'm happy enough to give a certain amount of latitude if Will wants to take that up, as long as it doesn't impinge on any relation to the committee. So, it will be a general response as opposed to. Uh, anything specific to this inquiry, so um, um, it's not an issue. I mean, just on, on the question proper issue. I mean, Mr. Alistair is, is an expert in this area and, and knows that the area, having done so much work uh, in his bill, will know obviously the set rules of what a special advisor is to do and the, the code of the special advisor, which sets out what is the role of a special advisor. And I don't think there's any better document than that to set out. Okay. I would just refer you to that. That is the, the document which is, is key. And okay. I mean, that's all I could say at this stage. Well, I mean, I mean that, that, that's actually fair enough. If I could actually, Dolores, are you were looking at But I was just chair. Um, um, well set out the protocols, you know, and all of the papers go to the minister mm. before they go out anywhere, basically. Yeah. And I understand that. But given that this <gasps> is not. Uh, uh, a normal type of request or situation. This is an inquiry where the committee, under the terms of the inquiry, are asking papers. Is there then, uh, therefore, a different protocol? Because presumably, as the most senior person within the department, you have to keep yourself right. You know, uh, uh, in terms of uh, whatever protections the department and yourself have to be afforded. So, therefore. Uh, in terms of the protocol uh, and requests, does the same protocol reply, uh, apply within that set of circumstances uh, uh, as pertains on, on everyday issues? Uh, I take at the moment that my guidance is that that protocol does, does apply at the moment, and that's, that, that's my understanding of it as an issue. But may I say, uh, uh, you know, I, let it be recognised that I and the Minister understand the sensitivity of this issue. And therefore, that you know that this is a sensitive issue, and therefore, you know, we are conscious of that issue. And as I say, I can give assurance that from what I've seen, the minister has been, and I think the chair has seen it as well. The minister is absolutely clear that this is a delicacy in this, in this, in this because of this inquiry, and this you know the committee can be assured the material will, will be got to them. Uh, and has the uh, just, just hasn't finished that point. Well, I was just. Well, I wonder at any stage has there have has there been a delay therefore, uh, <coughs> whatever requests uh, there's been approval given by yourself and going to the minister. Have, have there has there been any uh, areas of tension or any veto, in terms of any requests? There's been no veto. And any delays? No. I mean, it's a uh, swift turnaround, uh, Minister. I have to send that the committee's looking at this. Uh, it's okay to sell them this paper. Oh yeah, sure. Off it goes. The committee wants it. Therefore, uh, given the circumstances and the powers of the committee in terms of an inquiry power, mm -hmm. uh, it, it's more or less a rubber stamping matter by the minister. 
It's also important that the Minister knows what information is. is it, it, you know, I have a duty uh, to make sure my Minister is aware of everything that, 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 that is impressed and has agreed with the Assembly that I have that duty to do that, <coughs> so I make sure that that is complied with. Uh, but as I say, uh, th those things I think we can deal with and are dealing with effectively. I don't think it entirely answers the question, Chair, in terms of make, people are aware, but we're not being told as to whether it's uh, uh, just a, 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 a turnaround, you know, an immediate turnaround. So, yeah. I mean, if, if you didn't abide by the protocols at this moment, it is conceivable then that information could be passed to this inquiry that the Minister would not be aware of, mm. and since he is the subject of the inquiry, not only would it be unfair, mm. but it would put you in a particular difficulty or other officials who had supplied you with the information if the Minister were to say, well, actually, this information was supplied and I, I, I had no knowledge of it. Um, well, I think that, I mean, and that's obviously, I presume, behind why the protocol was written in the way it was, is essentially make a point, and as you say, I'm accountable to the Minister, and the Minister is accountable to you. And, and that, that whole, the whole <coughs> structure that you has been established for the system, therefore, is, is not irrelevant in this area. And I'd say we recognise sensitivities in this issue, and, uh, you know, I think... And <coughs> just, just so that uh, there's no misunderstanding, because I, I think the implication in the question and the, the points that have been made to you are twofold. Either that somehow or other the Minister then acts as a sift for the information which you send to him and which eventually comes to this committee, or else as a block either to frustrate the committee by, if not stopping the information totally, then delaying it. Mm. Now, given all of the information which has been sent from the department so far, are you aware of any occasions when the minister has either said that's not going, that's going in an altered form, or make them wait for it? Certainly, I've, the minister has made no, it's nothing he has done of that nature. No way. Very clear about getting materials you get forward to this committee. I mean that that's that's important and helpful for the, the inquiry yeah, to right. have that information. Uh, and just to make the point, Sammy, <coughs> for the record, uh, when anybody is invited here or required to attend here as a witness, they are they are actually provided under full disclosure from this end of the table with any relevant information which uh, would affect them. So this, there's total openness and transparency yeah. here under our uh, procedural fairness, uh, if you like, uh, working uh, procedures. Um, Maggie and then Salmon. Yeah, uh, <clears throat> obviously there are protocols that have to apply, sure. and but this is a unique situation in that, as far as I'm aware, <coughs> this is the first of its kind in terms of this type of inquiry conducted mm -hmm. by this committee or indeed any committee. So have the department considered yeah, that, more, um, and obviously it may set precedent mm -hmm. as as it evolves. Has the department considered that uh, pro protocols may have to be established to deal with this type of particular situation, which may vary or may be different from the normal protocols that apply on a day-to-day -day basis within the context of the Assembly? Um, just, I think uh, the protocol, of course, is between you, the Assembly, and we, the Executive, yeah. in a sense. So it's a joint protocol, um, uh, and it is your inquiry. Um, uh, so, in a certain sense, I think it's a joint issue for us, I suppose. It, does the experience of this inquiry lead any of us, uh, sorry, collectively, do we think that there are lessons when we have concluded this inquiry that we need to think about? And I suspect that may well be an issue which may be well worthwhile reflection. But uh, Mickey, I would suggest that's a joint issue for us, it's not just for the self. -made. All I can be aware of. I've been very <coughs> aware from the outset that this, this was the first time this sort of inquiry. And as I, I said to Kevin, uh, uh, in one of my issues, <coughs> uh, I saw this committee and you went into and you've thought through your protocols and your systems of how you did this inquiry. And I suppose uh, uh, at one stage, I suppose I thought in the summer, should I go and talk to Kevin about this issue, you know, um, about you know issues coming up? And I said, I said, well, no, I mustn't, because if I did that, I'd be seen to be interfering in, in your inquiry. It is your inquiry. I must be Now, I think the learning experience we've had here and the problems have come up, well, and you've come to us rightly and said, sort this out, and I think we're sorting it out. It is your inquiry. We are very keen to deal with those issues. 
but it, you know, the primacy of your role as a committee to do this inquiry is something which I deeply respect. Stuart, and then Trevor. Just, um, I, I understand the need for the protocol and the importance of the minister seeing or being aware of all the documentation that's been transferred. But then, of course, accept your, 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 your assertion that there's been no interference in that or, or any reluctance with, with regard to that. Who else sees the information which, which is passed to the minister before it comes here? Um, well, obviously, the, the rest of the senior, I mean, whoever's gathering the, the team yes. together and uh, the, uh, the special advisor will see it as it goes through as well. Right. OK. That's fine. Thank yes. you. The special advisor will see everything going to the minister. Trevor. Uh, th thanks. Um, well, you did say in, in terms of the protocols, the same protocols apply to all ministers in yes. terms of the, pr the permanent status? Yes, it's, 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 yeah. it's, it's, it's a protocol. <coughs> so, uh, maybe you've already referred to this, maybe in the first of its kind. So if Conor Murphy had still been here, would the same have happened with DRD if they had called an inquiry and has a religious discrimination case? Well, I don't know the detail of the process. Mm. Sorry, I haven't. But I mean, I can only presume that is the one which all civil servants work to. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Uh, you said earlier on well, that, uh, that you would look through the Minister's diary to look at what means he has on mm. uh, over, over, over the weeks. To see if, if you look at the diary and there are queries or there you, what you might see as a conflict of interest, or even if you go over uh, the means afterwards, would you advise the Minister that that, 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 that possibility arises? I'm talking in, in, in terms of a contractor meeting a minister in relation to uh, issues uh, that they may later um, uh, apply for contracts on it. We're in danger of straying into substantive uh, inquiry business, so um, <coughs> I don't, I, I'm not going to deal with that. Um, one of the things that uh, well, I want to come back to you on is that, and I don't really accept your characterisation earlier on that, you know, this is started off and it's an inquiry and you picked your own rules and um, the learning curve and all the rest of that. I mean, this, this, this matter has trundled along now for several months and longer. It's been subject to television programmes, assembly debates, committee uh, hearings and so on. Um, I'm, I'm putting it to yourself that I have a clear impression in my mind that there is a certain degree of, well certainly a lack of proactivity on behalf of the department to provide this inquiry with information. And even before the inquiry was established, I believe that there's information at the disposal of the department that seemed to contradict what people were saying. Um, and I find that something very, very serious and trying to grapple with it and in very diplomatic terms. Um, so for example, and as I identified early on, in the course of this inquiry, we have discovered additional information and other documents which the Department has provided to us, which contradicts, on more than one occasion, what evidence is presented mm. here. At what point does the Department, when the system throws up what appears to contradict what someone has either written or verbally given in evidence, at what point is the Department going to actually come and say, excuse us? Mm. We have evidence here which suggests so, that what you heard is actually not correct. Because well, that's very fundamental. Because yeah, that goes to the truth of these matters. Better. I mean, for example, you made the, the Michael Sands reference to saying he hadn't seen, you know, buses. and I mean, Michael, I, uh, if I understand rightly, and sorry, you know, once. Uh, I mean, Michael clearly did see uh, on the 17th of April. It, I think the record indicates he, he did do a change. In fact, you can see what he did. He cut and paste, he did a note. To his, uh, to the uh, his uh, <coughs> other, the um, uh, the um, uh, technical experts who he had sent off to, to check out the technical aspect, and he took that section because, and it's quite clear that, um, and, and he, uh, that the private secretary had sent him the notes on that date, yeah. uh, to, as, as she to check uh, that he, she got the right. That was her personal note of it. She wanted to know what was going on, just to keep record uh, of that, just to keep on top of it. And uh, he basically felt that her description of it wasn't correct, 
um, and you know, she's not an expert in it, in this, this area at all, um, and uh, she, he just took his section and put it in there, right? Now, he clearly had, forgot, he had forgotten about that issue, and I suppose if he'd been here today, I'm well, sure he would have said... I, I, I don't expect you, and in fairness to Michael, <coughs> he's not here, no, nor exactly. do I expect you to interpret no, no. Well, why or how anybody did anything. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, you asked, so, just saying the point is, if the situation came around and we came that there was a situation that something had not been disclosed, it's a very fair point that, uh, and we said, hey, there's evidence here. I, I, I take the point that there's a duty we would have to make sure that you've seen it, but I think the point is it truthfully. But in taking the point, what did you do about it? Sorry, I, I was working on the basis that Michael was going to be here today. Okay. Uh, you know, and if, if, if it had not been, if, maybe if I see somebody not, you know, if, if the situation comes and something has been, that, that is a point. It's important that there is transparency for this committee. Okay. So, Michael. Yeah. Uh, Chairman, I mean, I know that a lot of the discussion uh, so far has been around uh, a meeting and how it was described, mm -hmm. even though it's very clear that. Uh, from all of the documentation that we have been um, provided with, there was no attempt to disguise who was at the meeting because we know from the headed note paper. Mm. There is one particular area, though, Will, which I am getting particularly concerned about, and that is not around who attended a meeting or what under what mm. auspice the meeting was, but the substantive issue of, of the contracts themselves and the damage which has been done to some of the, the firms that were named um, as a result of information which came from the housing sector. Mm -hmm. now, we have had and we are having difficulty mm -hmm. in finding uh, or getting to the bottom of that because that's where the real obstruction has been um, in this inquiry uh, to date. What help can you uh, as permanent secretary in the department make available to this committee to ensure that the, the real issues i.e. Uh, about uh, the allegations about £18 million pounds being owed by contractors, the damage that that has done to their reputation. What help can you give uh, 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 afford the committee in ensuring that we get that information provided? That, that, that we're moving into another phase of the inquiry, so I, mean, I know yeah. it's, I, I don't want to be frustrating yeah. people here, but... If I could be assistant, just to say, I mean, that's presumably one of the points that your clerk, when they come yeah. to the meetings, will bring to our attention and this whole question of access to material is exactly the sort of issue which I hope we could then you know, resolve in that way. We, we will deal with that some at a later discussion because then we will try to date for <coughs> the committee had agreed prior to Christmas that we would uh, at a very early juncture in the new year take stock of where we are at in terms of this phase. We are <coughs> that this is uh, you know, taking a bit of time. Part of that has been because of the information we have not been receiving in a timely fashion and we are hoping to address that. But um, as I say, I do not want to be frustrating any member asking any question. They will have all the opportunity to ask those questions, but it's, it's the question is it has to be at the right time and under, under the proper circumstances. Um, so at this moment in time, if uh, members are, are content, I think we're just making it very clear, Will, that uh, certainly uh, I remain to be convinced on, on, a, on a range of these matters. I've given you some illustrations where I think it highlights very fundamental problems that we have had to address. And nobody wants to have to continue to face these, but I could consider to be really, in real terms, obstacles the, the work of this inquiry. Um, so, on that basis and on your own commitments, as I acknowledged earlier on, we'll sit down with Kevin McClure and work out how we best proceed in the time ahead. Okay, members, content then. We Thank you very much. move on to the next action uh, session. Okay, moving on to the. Next um, item on this particular evidence session, we have uh, with us uh, Stephen Brimstone, from morning special advisor to the Minister for Social um, Development. And I formally welcome uh, Stephen yourself here to the inquiry this morning. Um, and obviously, uh, just to say that uh, we had we had asked uh, Stephen to uh, brief the committee on on matters uh, outlined. Uh, I suppose in this written brief um, in relation to the meeting primarily on the 16th of April and any other attempt and matter around that. Um, and just to 
Again, formally remind uh, the committee and formally remind yourself, Stephen, that uh, Ms. McConaughey will be presenting evidence in the next session um, under a declaration, which is similar. Um, and there will be some overlap with some of the questions, so just in advance of that, um, just for the record. Um, so, Stephen, you've been asked to provide some uh, commentary to the committee, which you've done. Um, and I think that's on. Is that the table item page 14? Yeah. So it's in your page, table item page 14. Um, and I mean, just to make the point again, that that clearly states that the meeting was scheduled for Turkington's and not the reason. Uh, sorry. We're on the other 14. Sorry. 14 is the pre hearing page. 82. Page 82. I have 14. Okay, sorry, it's page 82. Okay. okay, Stephen, so do you want to just uh, give your opening remarks? The first instance? Thank you, Chair. <clears throat> Following the Minister's announcement in late 2011 that as part of its programme for government, the Northern Ireland Executive gave a commitment to evolve Northern Ireland Housing Executive NIHE homes fully double days by 2015, I was approached by a representative of Turkington Holdings who asked if they could meet with me to share that they believed this executive priority could be delivered with significant savings to the public purse. I agreed and I met with representatives of Turkington Holdings on the 25th of January 2012. Though I cannot recall the detail of the meeting, I do recall forming the impression that Mr Young was going to write to the department on behalf of the Glass and Glazers Federation asking for a meeting with the Minister to re in relation to realise potential savings. I subsequently verbally updated the Minister on the meeting I had held and indicated that it was likely that the GGF would request a meeting with the Minister. I was aware I was likely to be taking leave, so I verbally informed the Minister's private secretary a letter from the GGF requesting a meeting was to be expected, that the Minister was interested in what they had to say and that it was ultimately a matter for the NHE, the Chief Executive should also be invited. I attended a meeting on the 16th of April 2012 with Minister, Departmental Officials and NIHE officials, Mr Young and Mr McKaig. My role in attending was a special advisor to the Minister. I had been on leave when the letter requesting the meeting was cleared by Minister and had not seen that the meeting was being requested by Turkington Holdings as opposed to the GGF. I did not see this letter until around July 2013. In April 2012, I believe that though the meeting was attended by staff from Turkington Holdings, they were in fact representing the GGF. The only communication I had sight of or role in drafting or amending was a letter to the Chair of Committee for Social Development on the 24th of May 2012. The Minister's recollection of the meeting on the 16th of April 2012 was that while staff from Turkington Holdings were present, it was the GGF and the standards that were being discussed. The Minister also had a recollection that there had been a separate meeting with Fusion 21 where some of the same issues were discussed. He asked me that those suggested amendments be noted on the letter and it was sent back by a private office to <coughs> An amended letter which reflected Minister's amendments was subsequently sent back to the Minister with no concerns or alternative suggestions being raised. Okay, Stephen, thank you. Um, could you, before I bring all the members in, Stephen, can you, you, you met the target tons earlier in the year, so can you explain how you met them, why you met them, and, because it, it goes to the heart of why, I, mean, I, I take it you didn't, because you haven't referred to meeting them as representatives of the Glass and Glazing Federation, so you met them in other business, I'm trying to work out how you jump from. No, that's absolutely right. Turking tons approached me um, towards the end of 2011. Um, I, I don't recall exactly when, um, and asked for a meeting. I believe they, they um, were aware of ways in which significant savings could be made as part of the double glazing program, uh, and they gave some indication at that time. I think it was 30, 40 million. I didn't go into any more detail at that point, um, so I agreed uh, to have a meeting, and uh, it was set up for the 25th of January 2012. Okay, thank you, Billy. Really. Yeah. <coughs> Thanks for the presentation, Stephen. <coughs> Just a, a few questions. Um, had you met Turkey and Tons previously? Because they indicated in their evidence that I think they met you when um, the Minister was uh, Minister of Arts and Culture. It's going back a while. 
Um, so, had you been familiar with Turgentons before this? Had you had contact with them in any party political sense or, or social way or anything like that? No, I had no contact from a party political sense. I had no contact socially. Um, my, my recollection there was a, a Trevor Turkington's son was involved in touring car uh, racing. Um, there was some event or a meeting requested back in 2009. I, I had no other recollection of it. I think I might have something to do with Nuts Corner. Um, uh, and that's where I would have met uh, Trevor Turkington. Um, there was a, a subsequent event um, after we came into the Department for Social Development. Um, to discuss Marlborough House, um, and it was the, the Minister Atwood was at that meeting, and Mr. Minister Wilson was at that meeting. Um, just in relation to the um, briefing and the pre-briefing for the meeting, who commissioned that, and what, on what basis? Because John McPeak gave evidence to the effect that he was contacted to attend the meeting, but unusually wasn't asked for a briefing. It did seem unusual because obviously it was something that related specifically to issues that concerned the housing sector. So, who, who prepared that briefing and on what basis was the Commission? I, I had no idea. I wouldn't have been involved in that. So, you, as a special advisor to the Minister, a briefing would have been done for a meeting that had been arranged with Turkingtons, and you wouldn't have had any say or knowledge of that before? No. Um if you want, we can go back to the meeting, the, the, the pre-meeting that we had, and, and the essence of that pre-meeting was to ask if it would be appropriate that they would ask the minister for a meeting. The outcome of that meeting was that I agreed that it would be appropriate that they go and request a meeting with the minister, uh, and th then they subsequently wrote in requesting that. I, I, from the end of the pre-meeting, to be perfectly honest, I had no other contact um, until the meeting itself. So, presumably, this. Um, briefing for the meeting just appeared. It's presumably somebody had a commission. It's oh, I'm sure within the officials or housing division, someone within the department, once Minister had agreed to have a meeting, um, then th that would have been commissioned, absolutely. Because throughout that briefing it mentions Turkingtons, it doesn't mention the Glass and Glazing Federation. That's correct. And in relation to um, Turkingtons representing the Glass and Glazing Federation, they were very specific and clear in their evidence, but at no time did they indicate that they were representing the Glass and Glazing Federation. Also, the Glass and Glazing Federation, when they give evidence, indicated very clearly <coughs> the protocols, and we've been talking about protocols quite a lot this morning, that there were protocols involved if anyone was to represent them, that certain procedures had to be gone through. Um, and I think the only reference in their evidence was that Mr Young at one stage, I think, had been chair back in 2005-2006. So this, you weren't involved in that pre-briefing uh, note at all, that subsequently was presumed to be given the minister for what was going to happen at the meeting that he would be attending. So this is in relation to the submission the minister got as part of the meeting from officials. I had no role in that at all. <clears throat> Would just uh, normally with meetings of this kind, and there would be pre-briefing notes given. Would you normally have access to those, or would you normally see them? I, I would normally see them. <clears throat> absolutely, and I would normally see them in advance of the meeting. It, it so happened that meeting happened on a Monday, um, Monday afternoon. Uh, that, that Monday we had oral questions. The minister had oral questions. Um, so uh, between party business in the morning and preparing minister for all the questions. I hadn't had a chance that week to look at that week's folder, which would have held the submissions for that week. Um, I, I had no opportunity at all, and I believe we came straight out of um, oral questions and, and into the meeting with what now turns out to be Turkingtons. No, Stephen, can I, I mean, just press a little bit before bringing Jim in? Um, on page 14 of the, of the table pack, there is the, the briefing which was presented, which I think you're now saying that you didn't have a chance to read because of the oral Seven. question time. Yes, that's you're listed as the first recipient of the letter and the minister's number two. Yes. The meeting, clearly the heading of the meeting is meeting with Turkington Holdings. Um, we, I understand it, if I'm correct, that there was a pre-briefing, pre-meeting briefing. I, I don't believe we had it in that instance. Um, 
I, I had a personal appointment. Um, it turned out I wasn't able to stay for the whole meeting uh, that took place with Turkington's. I had a personal appointment after that meeting and I had to leave it early, actually. So I, I can't recall if, in fact, we went straight into that meeting. The Minister felt that he knew the issues that were to be discussed and he went straight into the meeting. I, I can't recall. That's a, a possibility that happened. We went straight into the meeting and there was no pre-brief before it. And, you, and that would happen on occasions. But you received that briefing on the 11th of April. The meeting wasn't until the 16th of April. I, I didn't know. I get that as part of my submission pack. That's the date that it was produced. I wouldn't have seen it until the, the actual meeting itself or as part of the, the, my pack for the week. OK. Uh, Jim? Uh, go, going back to the end of 2011, you said a representative from Turkington asked to meet you. Who asked to meet you? It was either Trevor Turkington himself or a PA working for Trevor Turkington. I, I, Jim, I can't recall exactly who it was. Well, how was it done? I, I think it was a phone call. I think it was a phone call. To the department or on your mobile? To my mobile phone. So Turkington's had your mobile number? They, they had it, I believe, from 2009, from whatever happened around that decal. Uh, and you can't help us whether you spoke directly to Trevor Turkington or not? On the phone, on late the phone. 2011. You can't help us on that? No, I can't recall, no. Can't recall? No, can't recall. Well, why do you think it might have been him at all? He, he had my mobile. He, he was the one who... Well, he had, mobile. had he phoned you before? No, no, he had my mobile phone from 2009 at the earlier event from the decal uh, time. This is a man you'd never met otherwise? No, I hadn't. No, no. But he had your mobile? Yes, all the people remember well, yeah. yeah. And uh, who then did you meet in January? January, uh, Trevor Turkington and Ian Young were at the meeting uh, in, on the 25th of January. Yes. Where did that meeting take place? It took place in the Radisson, uh, next door to the department headquarters. Right. And... Um, you don't. You seem to have some difficulty remembering details of that meeting. Did you not take any notes? I, I didn't. No, I was listening. Um, I felt I'd taken the main point away from the meeting to report back to the minister. No, your, your question is, did I take any notes? No, I didn't take any notes. Is it your custom and practice not to bother taking notes? Not if I'm in a listening exercise like that, no. Well, if you're listening, do you not want to be able to recall? Well, I, I, if after the meeting I feel that I'm not be able to recall before I report to the minister, then I would take a note, yes. So no notes taken? No notes were taken. And did you know what the meeting was going to be about before you went there? Other than the potential for savings as part of the double liaison programme, no. And would it not have been of particular interest to note uh, what those savings might be? Well, I reported to the Minister what the reported savings were after the meeting. Uh, the product of that meeting was a letter from Turkington's <coughs> to the Minister. That's correct, yes. Had you any part in drafting that? I had no part in, in drafting suggesting its content? Nope. Had you any part in suggesting it should be CC'd to DFP? Nope. In fact, I didn't see that letter. Um, when it arrived with Minister, I was, we actually had our second child. I believe it was the day before that letter arrived with Minister. So I was off and returned to leave it sure. <coughs> then for a number of weeks. So okay. I had a lot of now, things in my mind. When Turkington's representatives gave evidence to us, they were very clear. It's page 11 of the Hansard, uh, that uh, there was nothing said at that January meeting with you which could have given the impression that they were representing the Glass and Glazing Federation. you recall reading and seeing that evidence? Yes. Do you challenge that? In preparing for this, the briefing for the committee here, um, Hans, since I have given a significant amount of consideration to recall the precise detail of that meeting, which took place now some two years ago. And I, I recall the discussion around the GGF and Mr. Young's roles within that organisation. Um, I recall <coughs> the significant potential savings that they reported of the, the, the methodology in which we fit windows was adopted, um, which was in the tens of millions. Um, would be saved. Um, and that, that is my recollection of the meeting. I, I, I accept what Mr Young <clears throat> has said in his evidence. I can only give you 
my impression. So if you enough. accept what he says, then you accept that there was nothing said by them at that meeting which inferred or could cause anyone to conclude that they were representing anyone other than Turkington. No, I, I, can, only, I can only give my recollection of that meeting. Um, Turkington's came along, they had these great ideas to save money, etc. They were talking about how the housing executive should do things. Why did you simply not set up a meeting for them with the housing executive? Well, they, they, they claimed that they had attempted to, to meet with the housing executive. Now, bear in mind the history of where we come from in 2011 and the minister's view on the housing executive, their handling of contracts and all of that, and their ability to spend money or save money, whichever way you want to look at it. I, my, I felt my responsibility was to first of all tell the minister there was this opportunity. Um, he wanted to have a meeting. I, I suggested to the, the private secretary that as this was primarily to do with the housing executive, that the chief executive of the um, housing executive should be invited along to that meeting. But, but we now know, Mr. Burmistone, that three other contractors asked for meetings and were refused. Isn't when, that right? When was that? Well, we have that in our papers, that three other uh, named contractors yeah. asked for meetings and were refused. Yes, page 67 of the uh, table documents. <coughs> P.K. Murphy's, Paddy Michael Hatton, Super Sale Windows. When they asked through Sandra Overend were refused. When they asked through William McRae, they were um, granted a meeting. See that? Yes. Uh -huh. So, these were all parties who had an interest in the specifications, as Turkington's had, but only Turkington's got a meeting. Why was that? When we talk about specification, the four other meetings, the, the PK Murphy, the Paddy McElhatton, the Super Seal Window Systems Limited and Super Seal, well, are they both the same? Um, they were regarding the actual, from my recollection, um, they were to do with the specification of the hinges in this casement or whatever it was type. But the Turkington issue was, was about the method, methodology of actually fitting the window. <coughs> so well, did, did we actually tear out the plaster around the window frame or did, did we use a different methodology uh, which saved all of that happening? Well, uh, the heading is a list of all companies with an interest in, spe in specifications who had requested a meeting. Uh, would it be quite wrong for the committee to draw any inference from the fact that of all the companies who asked, only those who got a meeting were Turkington's and Super Seal after they came through the DUP, not through another party? Should we draw any inference from access to the minister uh, about that scenario? Well, none of that came through me. Now, we now know that on the 16th of April 2012, there was a great flurry of activity in the department about altering minutes and diary entries. And that on that day, for the first time on the sixth version of the minutes, they were altered to proclaim the meeting to be with the Glazing Federation. And the minister's diary was retrospectively altered on that very day to proclaim the meeting with the <coughs> Raising Federation. Can you cast any light on what was the catalyst for that flurry of activity on that day? I, I can't. I can't. I, I have had no sight. We, we keep hearing reference to the, the, the four, now the six drafts of the, the note of the meeting. I, I had no sight of any of those, and I, and I, I, and I wouldn't have. Well, are they not on the trim system? I don't have access to the trim system. You don't? No. I thought special advisors were all knowing and all seeing. You don't have access to the trim system? I don't have access to the trim system. Is that a prohibition on special advisors accessing the trim system? Maybe it is, um, but I, I don't have access to the trim system. Um, so your evidence to this committee, and I assume it would be no different if you're giving it on oath 
Um, I, I, listen, I, is, I tried to tell the truth right, in everything. Your speak. evidence is that you, you, you had no lot or part, directly or indirectly, yeah. in altering or having altered the minutes or the diary entry. Is that right? Yes, and I'll go further than that. I, I, can have, I have no recollection of having made any or requested any changes to any private office meeting note. It wouldn't be normal practice for me to be involved, and I, that applies both to DCAL as well as to DSD. Would and it be I, normal? I, I, I just, I, I'm perfectly honest, as the Minister outlined in his opening remarks, um, my, my, my sense of all of this was, as the Minister outlined in his opening remarks, and I'll quote him here, as is the usual process, the note was drafted and was then amended to more accurately reflect the discussion, as I at that time believed that the attendees were representing the Glass and Glazing Federation, the note was finalised to reflect that position. So you cannot help this committee whatsoever as to what caused that flurry of activity on the 16th of May? No, I'm sorry, I can't. Yeah, if, I, what, if I could just actually maybe helpfully intervene at this point, because that flurry of activity you described actually occurred on the 16th of May. Mm. Sorry. Which I, did I not say May? April, you said. And, and, and that was on the basis that a letter was sent yes. by me on behalf of this committee electronically to the department seeking clarification from the minister. So I would suggest that that is the reason for the flurry of activity. So, Jim, I'd just like to be at the uh, right, okay. right 16th of May. When did you become aware, Mr. Brimstone, of a letter from the chairman of this committee? Whenever, these issues. whenever the minister would have seen that letter, I, mean, I, I, I wasn't aware of uh, that letter from you, Chair, until the minister and I were sitting in an office together and it arrived up as part of the pack. Um, On that same day, the 16th? No, it wouldn't have happened. Whatever time it took for officials to go and draft a response to it and everything else, I wouldn't have seen your letter. The minister wouldn't have seen your letter, Chair. Well, could, could, a, differ, could a catalyst have been... Three assembly questions tabled on the 10th of May by Mr. Mackay, asking for details of all meetings had with groups from the glass and glazing industry in the last year, asking to whom he spoke in the glass and glazing industry that led to his concern about value for money, asking uh, prior to his announcement in the assembly about postponement, uh, uh, etc. Could that have been the catalyst for the flurry of activity on, uh, that within a week on the, sixth, uh, uh, on the um, 16th of May? So, so there were the, the written questions, there were meetings had in the department around what the housing professionals in the department's response was on the back of the meeting with Turkington's, as it now turns out. Uh, the minister was very keen to have these issues looked at. Is there any merit in them or whatever? And the minister continually throughout all of this and whoever would have been in the room would have heard it. They continue to refer to all of this as the representatives of the Glass and Glazing Federation. I mean, that, that was his impression. Well, that was my impression. Yes. Anybody who was in the room at until the, time, the Until the 16th of May, a minute which had been through five versions referred to it as Turkington's. The minister's diary until that date referred to the meeting being with Turkington's. I'm trying to invite you to help this committee to find what the catalyst was for that flurry of activity on the 16th of May that suddenly wrote Turkington's out of the script and wrote the Grass and Grazing Federation into it. Now, was it the Parliament? Was it the Assembly questions? Was it something else? Can you help us at all? Well, as I said before, Jim, I had no role in changing that <coughs> note. I mean, I have no recollection of changing any meeting note that happened in the department uh, with regard to meetings. Um, I'm trying to raise one other point in there, actually, and it slipped my mind now. I was going to come back to you on. Um, well, well, while you're thinking about that, so is Rick Lear, you're saying expressly to us, you gave no instructions, you took no actions yourself, you had no one else give instructions, you can shed no light on why those changes were made. I, I have no powers to give instructions in the department. 
I have no powers at all to give instructions to anyone. No. The only, the only that action... wasn't the question. The question was, did you give any instructions? Did you have anyone else give instructions? No, no the, the only person... No, I, no, I didn't. And, and the reason why I didn't, and the reason why I, I can't, I, I have no powers to give instructions. The Minister's the only per person... I could give instructions to them blue in the face in the department. And it's unless the Minister... Did you give any advice to the Minister that the minutes should be changed, that the diary should be changed, that, that the trail should be, ter be converted from Turkingtons to Glass and Glazing Federation? No, because I, I wasn't even aware of what was in the note of the meeting. But you were aware when it came to drafting or redrafting the letter that the Minister was sending back to the Chairman? Oh, absolutely, absolutely. And yes. it's in your hand? It is in my hand, yes. Is that because you, the idea originated with you? No, we, quite often. Um, we all work together in the office, whether it's the office in the department or whether it's the office here in Parliament Building. And the papers would have arrived. Generally, what happens is the papers arrive with me. I'll make comments on if any questions put back to officials or anything else. I'll put them on it. And, and you will see if the special advisor makes a comment on something, it's classified as the special advisor has queried this or the special advisor has asked for this to be changed. When this, when this letter came up, my first recollection was the whole on this meeting was with the last place in the Federation, was it not? <clears throat> At that point, I would have asked the Minister what his recollection of the meeting was. His recollection of the meeting was it was with the last and place in Federation. Another point. So you sold that idea, did you? No, I asked the question of the Minister. Was my interpret was my recollection of the meeting the same as his? Mm -hmm. At which point he he agreed. Uh, there was another point raised, but was there not another meeting with Fusion Twenty One around similar matters? Mr. Brimstone, was there any sensitivity with you or the Minister? Uh, given that Turkingtons were known to be uh, party supporters yeah. of, uh, of the Minister's party, was there any sensitivity about the meeting with Turkingtons? No, not at all. I, I have no knowledge of who party supporters are or aren't. I, I have no knowledge of that at all. Are you a member of the, of the DUP? I'm a member of the DUP, yes. yes. On the 28th of June, Susan McCarty, do you know who that is? Yes, yes. Uh, advised the housing executive that the meeting uh, had in fact been with the Glass and Glazing Federation. Have you any evidence to give as to how that came about? No, I, no, I don't. So as far as you're concerned, if Barbara McConaughey made the changes to the minutes, made the changes to the diary on the 16th of May, you can shed no light, which would suggest she didn't just do that on her own volition. No, but uh, <clears throat> uh, the, the private secretary would have been sitting in any meetings that the minister would have had with officials. The private secretary, secretary would have been fully aware of what the minister's view of that meeting was. And that's the only thing I can assume. Was she sitting in at the meeting when the letter back to this chairman was amended? That wasn't a meeting. We were just working together in the room. So she wasn't there then? No, no. Oh. Glass and Grazing Federation have claimed that they've boasted of a relationship being established with you. What can you tell us about that? I, I have no idea, <clears throat> excuse me, what they're referring to. I can only assume that they actually referred to the previous special advisor in the department. I had no communication with the, the Glass and Glazen Federation. In fact, I'll go further. My first introduction to who the Glass and Glazen Federation were, I'd never heard of them before, was at the pre-meeting with Turkingtons and the Radisson Hotel at the end of January 2012. So you're in the happiest position, Mr Brimstone, of being having access to the top and heart of the department, but having been totally unable to help the committee as to how significant changes were made to minutes, to diaries, to write a particular company that has had a meeting with the minister out of the script and write someone else in. That was a point I forgot earlier on, Jim, and apologies. Yeah. I mean, and I do rule in this, but I mean, looking at the, the note of the meeting, even in this final draft, Turkingtons are clearly referred to. Oh, yeah. Clearly referred to in the first paragraph. A, a written answer to, I believe, Daphne Mackay, and, and an answer to a question in early September as well, clearly identifies Turkingtons as being the company to which the individuals who we believe at that point are representing the last Glazen Federation worked for 
I, I don't see. I, I don't see any. I have no sense of how there was any attempt to cover up the fact that Turkingtons were at that meeting. Well, certainly, there were changes made on the 16th of May. Absolutely. To headings, to minutes, and diary entries, retrospective changes to diary, which might seem rather bizarre. Yes, which reflected the minister's take on the whole thing. Yes. Does that suggest that direction came to the minister? I, I no sense that the minister directed it. He, he, he may well have done. He may well have done. But thank you. The minister has said that he has. He's not aware of this note either. Well, we are. We are going to return to that. Uh, Thanks. And we have our next uh, evidence item with Barbara McConaughey because, I mean, this is a irrelevant uh, testimony. And I would remind uh, yourself, Stephen, as I would every uh, witness to this uh, inquiry, that. Uh, the committee, in, in looking at the inquiry, took the view that we will uh, take every uh, witness uh, on the basis of professional integrity, and uh, we wouldn't be uh, requiring people to take an oath or swear a uh, declaration or an affirmation. But that where we had at any time had any uh, conflicting evidence, then we would we would do so, and we have done so, uh, uh, which will manifest itself later this morning. Um, and I'm just making the point that if, at any time, if we come across what we see as conflicting evidence, and we already had that uh, provided to us before today, that we will not be hesitating to bring people back on oath or with affirmation. And just want, for the record, to remind the greater public the implication of that in terms of the potential legal uh, requirements of all of that and potential legal outcomes of that, because it goes to the uh, question of perjury. So, um, in, in relation to your own evidence before bringing in of two other members in the kitchen so far, uh, you were saying, Stephen, at, at, at no point you sought to change any references to Target Tons uh, to refer to them as Glazen, Glazen, Glazen Federation representatives. Um, and I put it to you that we have been advised, we have been asked to Accept information which basically tells us that despite all of the other evidence, verbal and written, which was at your disposal, that you still had a recollection that you were dealing with the Glass and Glazing Federation. Yes. But there's been no explanation as to how you made that impression because Turkingtons have made it very clear at no stage that they represent themselves. In fact, they were emphatic about that. We had the uh, letter from Turkington requesting a meeting, we had the briefing paper. For the meeting, which was held on the 16th of April, we've had the flurry of activity subsequent to that on the 16th of May. We have had the, and I'm less concerned about the Spotlight Program, um, but the Spotlight Program wrote to you, I think, in June, um, which was a very controversial program to say the least. I'm more concerned about the information provided then to this assembly uh, and to this committee, and we have been asked to accept that. Notwithstanding all of the evidence that has been presented, written and er, uh, verbal, that you still have an impression that you have been dealing with glass and glass and glass, despite the fact that nothing else, that nothing anywhere indicates that that was the case. Absolutely. I, I left the meeting on the 25th of January 2012 with the clear impression that a request was going to come to the Minister from Ian Young. But in his role as uh, the, the, the Glass and Glazen Federation, <coughs> excuse me, and former chair, it was a shock to me when I first seen the letter in July 2013, and the logo at the top of that letter was Turkingtons as opposed to the Glass and Glazen Federation. And you're also saying then that uh, you'd no other part in amending the aid memoir minute of the meeting. Um, and we were advised, and I think at least a written submission from Barbara McConaughey, that she had not seen, she had only seen a final version, which was then described, I think, as a final version, which was version four, uh, until it was presented to her by the Dallo. Now, obviously, we were specifically asked uh, Barbara this question, but you're saying you certainly had no. Role I, and I wouldn't normally say that either. Okay. Tramacon and Sammy Wilson. Sir, uh, to be brief, there's a, a lot of stuff that I was going to be asked. 
thing. Uh, at a meeting or a, a memo or a letter sent uh, to yourself and the Minister on uh, the 11th of April from Susan McCarty, it quite clearly says you've accepted a meeting with Jim McCabe and Ian Young uh, from Turkington Homes. There's no mention of uh, the Glass and Glaze and Federation fatter, on that. In fact, uh, I think it, uh, on the a, a, a memo sent on the, the uh, from uh, Margaret Gibson, uh, uh, Declan, um, what's the second name? Declan Allen. Uh, Declan Allen uh, from the Housing Executive actually said, I'm no to page, just for, uh, well, oh, Sorry, it's page 85 of the table. Uh, uh, it said, he said, at no time did Declan think that Turkington were representing the Glass and Federation. Uh, Federation. Uh, tell me, where, where do you think the confusion came from on, 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 on all this? <laughs> the confusion clearly came on the back of the pre-meeting that I had had with Turkingtons, um, and my expectation that, and I briefed the minister to the effect that Ian Young would be writing in as the Das and Lazen Federation um, to him. Um, the confusion also arose because I was off when the actual letter arrived in requesting the meeting. And I, I, I didn't see that letter until July 2013. I had no sight of that letter until July 2013. Uh, requesting the meeting. Yeah, uh, it just seems that, that uh, it's, a, it's a bit strange that there's a series of meetings that take place. Everybody that we have uh, had in the chair, uh, everybody is quite adamant uh, that uh, the class. And Glazen Federation were not representative. Like, and it's just a bit strange to believe that you nicely met them, yeah. uh, you organised a meeting, uh, and that the minister uh, w w was advised that, as you're saying, that he was made representatives of the Glass and Glazen Federation. I didn't organise the meeting with the minister. I, advised, I, I suggested to them that it would be worthwhile them writing to request a meeting with the minister. And on the back of that, I had briefed the minister that I had met. Did, with uh, two staff members from Turkingtons, one was Ian Young, who had a role in the Glass and Glazen Federation, um, and, and that to expect a letter. I, I outlined as well the, the potential savings and the, the idea behind how windows are fitted in a house. It was all through the Glass and Glazen, it was all through their specifications, their standards. It was nothing to do with a particular company. Um, and I was, they never said it. Sorry? They never stated that they were representatives of the Glass and Glazen Federation. Uh, 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 which meeting? But, uh, the initial meeting that, uh, that you had with them? The initial discussions that you had with them? No, no, they were there as members of staff from Turkington's at that initial meeting I had with them. But I was under an understanding that a letter was going to come from them, or sorry, not from them, from Ian Young, um, requesting a meeting as the Glass and Glazen Federation, speaking on behalf of the wider industry. Did, did he say that he was going to send you a letter? Uh, that stated that the, the, it was coming from the, the, that he was representing the Glass and Glazen uh, Federation. Sorry for that. Just could you repeat that? Sorry, just. Did, did he say to you that uh, he was sending he will send a letter uh, saying that he represented the Glass and Glazen Federation? That, that's my recollection of the meeting. That that was what was going to happen. Uh, the, the, the other thing is, and I tried to approach it earlier on, is that do you not think it's unusual that uh, someone who is a contractor or a subcontractor of another contractor? There's an interest in uh, the, the, the glass, glazing contracts or other contracts uh, would have access to the minister uh, to doing what it, and I think the question was touched on early on, that they would not be uh, advised uh, to talk to the, 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 the body that, can, that the controls, which is the housing executive. That, that's the reason why I asked or suggested that the chief executive of the housing executive should be at that meeting if the minister agreed to have it. Yeah. But see when, see, when you look back and you, you, you said, Jim, Jim raised the, 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 the question uh, the, the, this morning, is that uh, the Turkingtons was given access to the minister if three other firms were not, uh, that, uh, that it, it, it could be seen as a conflict of interest and, yeah. uh, and following through that? Well, I believe the reason why two out of the three subsequent weren't, and I need to check up into this, was that the minister had already listen to what the issue was around the hinge and that and, and pass it on to the housing executive. It was a matter for them to deal with. He had no role uh, in deciding the specification of the, the window itself. He had no role in that at all. And that's why he felt he had no role in, in meeting the other two organisations. 
And to see, just to see that in terms of the savings that Turkington's talked about, yes, are they transparent? I think well, I believe it's fifteen point one million. Uh, that, that, that has been savings uh, yes. of fifteen point one million. Because yeah. we've been given a number of figures of uh, of what, what savings may. Uh, I, I believe it's fifteen point one million pounds. Thanks, Sammy Wilson. Okay. Oh, 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 sorry, sorry. Oh, thanks. Um, maybe if we can just go through the chronology of events again, um, Stephen. You'd met with Turkingtons uh, and representatives from Turkingtons um, in the, the the late part of the year. At that stage, had before that, had you ever heard of the Glasgow Glaziers Federation? No, not at all. So it did come up in conversation with Turkingtons at length um, that either some of the people who were there were members of the Glass and Glazers Federation, were representatives, had held some standing in that organisation, and also they talked about the standards which were normally set down by the Federation. That's what planted the idea. You're, you're saying that's what planted the idea of the Glass and Glazers Federation in the head. That's the first I've heard of the last days in the Federation. Uh, I genuinely came out of that meeting Excuse with me. the impression that a letter was going to be sent to the Minister from the Glass and Glazing Federation. And between that and just so we can get, because it's come out in some of the answers you've given, but let's just get the sequence. From that, it was agreed, and this was quite unusual for a special advisor, it was agreed that. You would then go to the minister and say you think you believe it's worthwhile having this meeting, mm -hmm. and between that and the meeting, you never, you were not, were, were you aware of the letter coming in, who the letter came from, what the letter said, or anything like that. I, I'm not even sure that I queried it up until the point that the meeting happened. I'd be perfectly honest, and um, we we just had a, another addition to the family. Is back from leave. You're catching up back from leave, but you've been off. I no, no I, I had no sense that I was aware that that, that letter had arrived. And so then, when the meeting, uh, uh, so the, the the next contact, I suppose, was the meeting. Yes. At that meeting, all of the issues that had been discussed at the pre-meeting were discussed. So. It was quite, it's quite um, reasonable to assume that these were issues which would have been of concern to the Glass and Glazers Federation. Right, absolutely. It was the same issues were discussed um, with the Minister and with the Housing Executive and with the senior departmental staff from the Housing Division as, as had been discussed at the pre meeting. What has been made of um, the, the, the fact that Turkingtons were granted this meeting? Had other organisations which were associated with this contract sought meetings, first of all, with the housing executive that you were aware of? Could you repeat the question? Yeah, I mean, so, so some of the contractors, were you aware that some of the contractors had sought meetings and been refused meetings with the housing executive? I, I believe that was one of the issues that led to Turkington's request in the meeting with me. And um, the, the, the fact that Turkingtons were granted me, because it's, it's been made about uh, this, the fact that Turkingtons were granted the meeting as opposed to the others who were not granted meetings, can you have any, give a, any explanation for that? Well, the Turkington meeting was requested much earlier on in the year. The, the other meetings that were requested was around a particular issue, and I believe the committee was quite heavily involved in that issue as well. And that was around a, a separate but closely linked issue. But the, the other, please, the other um, companies um, were about a particular separate issue and all about the same issue. Okay. Um, the, the, there's uh, been suggestion that this was an attempt to light Turkingtons out of the script, I think, to use the the, um, the terms that the Jim <coughs> has used. How, how could Turkingtons be written out of the script in this? I mean, can you maybe just take us through the the, 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 the trail that you're now aware of, that, that very clearly pointed that Turkingtons were all part of the script anyway? Yes, so a letter arrives from Turkington Holdings, and Ian Young, who's a managing director within a I believe a subsidiary company within Turkin and Holdings request a meeting with the Minister. Um, the meeting is held. Um, the meeting is held with departmental senior officials, the meeting is held with senior housing executive officials. 
Um, I don't see how anybody could interpret that as being an attempt to write something out. There was nothing shady, nothing dodgy, nothing in any way that would be inappropriate. I, I would have seen about it. Not in the letter, of course, the briefing. Um, Absolutely, the briefing as well, to, yes. So any attempt, I mean, any allegation that's being made here that somehow or other you contrived or someone else contrived to write Turkingtons out of the script just does not bear any relation to the facts or to all of the, the, the paper evidence that there is. You know, I mean, the only change that, and now I'm aware of this change, the only change that was made was to reflect what was clearly the Minister's opinion, and that was on the note of the meeting, um, that, that the meeting was with the Lass and Lazen Federation as opposed to Turkington's. And, you know, if either you or the Minister or an official uh, believed that it was uh, the meeting actually was with the Glass and Glaziers Federation, it would be quite in order to change the minute to reflect that with them. Well, in the interest of accuracy, um, absolutely. It would be expected, I would have thought, to, to go and change that to reflect the Minister's view. Uh, Fran McCann said it was a, it's been unusual for uh, someone who's involved in a contract to ask for a meeting with the Minister. Do you find that unusual? No, um, I, I don't. Um, as you, we can see there, there was a number of requests from companies um, who were involved in contracts to see the minister. Um, and so out of the one, two, three, four companies listed, the minister seen two of those companies, and, just, and that's on that issue um, on Windows. Would you... Uh, and have you had any other experience of where f firms, because I would have had experience uh, as a minister of this, where firms feel that they haven't made any traction with officials that they would then seek to go to the top? Well, ab absolutely. I, I can give no examples off the top of my head now, but that, that's, that's quite often what happens. Individuals, whether it's an individual or a company, feel they have no other recourse but to go to the minister. I haven't tried all other avenues. And whether there's, there's any party affiliation which you know of or don't know of, that should not be a, a reason why people should not have access to a minister, should it? No, absolutely not. And I'll state again, I mean, I'm not aware of who the Democratic Unionist Party's financiers are, or supporters are, or anything else. It was news to me when Mr Alistair um, declared that um, Turkington had provided some funding for vans or whatever for his election. Um, and the Spotlight programme identified that, I think it was Stephen Moutry, um, Trevor Turkin had some role in his nomination. That, that was all news to me. I, I wasn't aware of any of that. Dolores. Thanks, Chair. And, um, Chair, if I could just pick up on a couple of points, because um, I think uh, people have talked about uh, Turkin an attempt being made to write Turkingtons out of the script, and yet on uh, page 91, uh, uh, very literally, uh, Turkingtons were written out of the script in relation to the letter to yourself, Chair. Um, and uh, can I just ask uh, you then, Mr. Robinson, to confirm that the handwriting uh, to amend uh, and to remove Turkingtons from the script of the letter is in fact your handwriting? I think I've already done that with Mr. Alistair earlier on, but absolutely, Dolores, that's my handwriting. Thank you. And then, on whose direction uh, did you amend that, given that you were aware that the meeting request was with Turkingtons? I wasn't aware the meeting request was with Turkingtons. At all? No. No. And uh, so you, you didn't see that there was any reason as to why that would be <coughs> changed or ask any questions in relation to that of anyone? No, I, I believed, the Minister believed, that the meeting was in reality with the Glass and Glazing Federation, as opposed to Turkington's. And, and it was purely in the inter interest of accuracy. Oh boy. Nothing else, oh boy. <clears throat> excuse me, as to why that letter was changed to reflect that. And also the Minister felt that Fusion 21, because they had some recollection that um, Fusion 21 had some role in all of this as well, not at the same meeting. But bear in mind, the Minister quite often makes amendments to letters, or I make suggestions, there's a difference there. They go back to branch. If there's any issues, and sometimes there are and sometimes there are not, those issues will come back up to the Minister. 
There was no issues came back mm -hmm. from officials around any of those changes. And the Minister continued on in the belief that this meeting was with the Glass and Glazing Federation. I, I, perhaps I misunderstood, but I understood at the outset you said that you never made any amendments to letters that you didn't initiate those. Maybe I could get wrong. No, sir, that, that was uh, departmental, departmental meeting notes. I, I have no role in any of that at all. I, I day on daily, get papers come up to me that are for the Minister. I will put queries on them, I will put suggested amendments on them. Uh, that, that happens on a day on day, daily basis um, as part of the approval process that goes to Minister. Okay. So it's very separate from the departmental? Absolutely. That's a private office issue and I'm outside okay. of that. And, and can I just ask then, in relation to the four companies that uh, wanted a meeting but only two companies were granted, what criteria was used to, uh, to agree the meetings with two companies and not with the other two? It was Minister who agreed to those meetings. And I, so I, you, would, you would have no influence over the Minister on whether he should meet any particular well, it's, generally, it's generally a combination of things that the Minister will take when deciding on his departmental official advice. and um, There may be advice from myself on the issue as well. Mm -hmm. um, that's, that's all I can really give on that, I'm afraid. So there's no reason why two would have gotten, two wouldn't have got? Other than the reasons I've already outlined earlier on. Yeah, and um, the, the uh, amendments then... Um, <clears throat> that uh, were made in relation to the, the draft letter, um, were those ever discussed with Mr Michael Sands? They were sent back to the branch which Michael Sands is part of. Mm -hmm. um, that's part of the private office. So in essence, a paper comes back from Minister with suggested amendments or whatever else on it, mm -hmm. back into the private office. They sent it back down to the branch to verify to check that. I came back up and there was no issue. I mean, the letter was amended, reflecting the Minister's request, uh, and the Minister went on and signed it and shared it right with you. Do, do you not find that very strange, given that the diary uh, entry was subsequently amended to tie in with the amendments of the letter, and uh, the eight memoirs or minutes were uh, drafted six times? Do you not find that strange, just looking uh, back? To be honest, it, it's outside. I, I have no sight of that at all. I have no connection with that at all. But you can understand the wider perception. Well, ab absolutely. Uh -huh. uh, absolutely. I mean, I can understand the wider perception of that. I can't give any insight into it, I'm afraid. And you can't give us any insight in, into the influence of the Freedom of Information requests that were received by the Department in relation to the minutes or the meetings? And whether no. or not those were inf th that, that influence, that time scale that Mr. Alistair was talking about in the flurry of activity from Mr. Dahi McKay. I believe on the DSD website the uh, Freedom of Information requests come in from Mr. McKay, MLA, as well. You, you, you're not aware of that? No. Sorry, I'm not aware of what? The Freedom of Information requests in relation to the meetings as well as the uh, AQs. That's not the time I would have been aware of it. You're asking me today, I'm aware of a particular freedom of information request and, and my reaction or Minister's reaction to that FOI, no. And bear in mind as well, FOIs come in and it can take some time before they arrive up with Minister to clear as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, mm -hmm. Stuart. Just a, a, just, just Mr. Fry, you just want to come in yeah. briefly on the back yeah, of what's just, just so a, what bring. He, he spoke about uh, the, the move to write talking tons out of the meeting. The fact is that others were being written into the meeting mm -hmm. and it didn't take part in the meeting. And just uh, the, the other point that I want to raise is that did you realise at the time when Turkingtons had asked and even give their, their, their briefing uh, that there, there were other members of glazing companies who were seriously questioning uh, the information being given? And secondly, uh, the, 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 the length and time of the lifetime of, of, of the, the, uh, the specifications given also? Or the Is this the hinge you're talking about? Is this the hinge issue? Yeah, I'm talking talk about that when they went to, to talk about the double days and people came and said that they weren't given the opportunity. Yeah, I, I think that the methodology of fitting the window was a separate issue to the hinge yeah. issue. Um, and to be honest, at the time of the meeting with um, what's now Turkington's, um, <coughs> None of those other issues were on the table at all. The Minister, I don't think, would have any side of those. 
So there was one point, just sorry, Chair, and thank you for your indulgence, Mr. Bremson. Am I right in, in uh, recollecting uh, that you uh, suggested that the Minister, in relation to the uh, specifications for the windows, would have no part to play in that? <coughs> the Minister would have no actor part to play in the specifications for the uh, windows and the hinges? That, that would be a technical decision for the. Uh, Housing executive. So, so then, are you not shocked uh, whenever, if you read page 20, at an email from uh, DSD Norman Slater to, uh, no, from Thomas to Nor Thomas O'Reilly with the double glazing program, that he says in the opening line, "I wasn't aware that the minister was going to approve the window specification." I, I would I, suggest that the minister had full authority in, in a, at that level of approval, which contradicts, I would suggest, what you said earlier. I, I don't believe the Minister has any role in the approval of technical specifications. But it's quite clear that both the housing, the DSD and others do. Can, can I follow on that point, Chair? Okay, I do, just to bring up that point, Stephen, I don't know if you have a copy of this or not. What, but, what number is the top of the page? Well, the, the top of the page, I think, that the Lord's referring to is page 20. But is that, if Stephen wants to turn to number 20 and number 17? Because I think uh, 20 originates from 17. Can you read 17 first, Stephen, just? I think those so, are... So, so Chairman, Senator, I'm on the floor now. Given the, the date of that email, which I think from my memory is the day after the meeting with the representatives or Turkmenes or whatever we want to call them, yeah. where Michael Sands contacted Norman. Could it be construed from that that Norman may be getting a wee bit concerned maybe that the Minister was showing them the error of their ways, that there was actually potential savings? And that, that, that Norman and his department had actually got it wrong? The, the, the response... On page 20, the response is sent to Norman from a Thomas. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, I'm trying to see who this Thomas individual is. Thomas Riley. He's the chief executive of the Social Security Agency. I don't think it is the same. It's, it's not the same one, no. But he's a multi skilled yeah. individual, but I'm not sure. But, 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 sorry, but, but, but Michael Sands had sent this to Norman as well and a list of others. In terms of that, this came a few days afterwards, yes. referring to the meeting that happened on the 16th yes. and outlining, obviously, I can understand the point, possibly I'm sure you do as well. Stephen, the ministers don't normally get involved in specifications. Yes. But they are responsible for the money that's spent within their department. A absolutely. And if someone from the Federation or Federation or someone who fits windows, who wants to talk with Turkmenes, comes forward and shows them a suggestion where they can save millions of pounds, would you not think it would be normal that the minister would be concerned and pass that further out to his department? Oh, a absolutely. But the minister would have passed that to technical yeah. experts to make a decision on. Yeah. He would have listened to it, and that sounds like a legitimate case that's been made. Can you <coughs> investigate that to make sure that it is as it sounds? Yeah. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. okay. Um, Stuart. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Mr. Rumstone, you just going back to the little piece that we, Mr. Alistair talked about earlier on. <coughs> statement from the glass glazing federation i think you said you thought maybe they were referring to a previous advisor is that right sorry the, the stlp from the previous i was only in the department number of months at that time but after the election the well may 2011. okay so uh, I, I, listen I, i've got nothing i, I had no communication with or what? from the glass and glazing federation my first introduction to the glass and glazing federation was at the meeting on the 25th of january 2012. But I mean, I, I heard what you said about the potential that it might, they might have been making reference to a previous special adviser. However, the press statement is October 2011 when you were in office, and the actual quotation is, and I quote, a relationship is being established. That there's a clear implication that's with the new adviser. Well, uh, I can only say that I've had no contact with them. So it would be unfair to suggest that they were actually making reference to a previous No, I, I wasn't. I was only suggesting potentially what could have been happening. I, I have had no contact with the Glass and Glazing Federation. I didn't, I wasn't even aware of their existence before the 25th of January 2012. Did you see that press release? No. 
What page is it, Stuart? Just, do you want to indicate? Maybe a supplementary is that, sir? Okay. It, sorry, it's, it's um, the date of the press release. I'm not quite sure of the press release. Here's an idea. An idea. Thank you. Is there a specific point you want to make about that? or? Well, it just makes reference to the fact that a, that a relationship is being developed, and Mr. Brimstone had indicated that he thought it wasn't him that was being referred to. But given the dates, it probably couldn't be anybody else other than him. Okay. In terms of yeah, supplement, yeah, yeah, just just given that Stuart maybe wants to hang out a suspicion around Stephen on that particular aspect, should we write I back to, to sorry, sorry, Chairman, sorry, could, should, just yeah, people. should we write back to the last and Dennis Federation and ask them to establish who that individual may be? Um, I think that may be useful to either rule Stephen in or rule Stephen out. May bring someone else, a previous special advisor, you never know. I understand we did that and have not yet received a response, but you're right, we'll follow that up. Yeah. If you have enough. Jim, can I just ask one mm -hmm. question? I mean, Stephen, do you see any significance in the fact yeah. that after the meeting, the memo that came from Michael Sands has at least two, three references to the Glass and Glazier Federation? Page I mean, 17. On, on page 17. Um, I mean, would that not indicate, and it probably help us strengthen your view, that you had a meeting in January at which Glasgow <coughs> guidelines and associations that Ian Young had with them was mentioned, you had no knowledge at all of the letter coming in from Turkington Holding. The meeting was held. Quite clearly there were liberal references to the Glasgow Glazier Federation at that meeting. Um, you know, would that not indicate that, or perhaps have reinforced in your mind, that this had something to do with the Class and Glazier Federation? It certainly seemed to have played quite significantly um, on the, uh, the, the report that Michael Sands. My recollection of the meeting that happened, that took place between Minister and Turkington's, as it now turns out, the only thing discussed at that meeting, from my recollection, was glass and glazing standards, guidelines, the differences between the, house, the way the housing executive uh, carry out work as opposed to the glass and glazing federation guidelines and standards. That, that, from my recollection, that was the only issue discussed at the meeting. It was all about the glass and glazing federation. And the memo was dated the day after the meeting, which would indicate that it was fresh in the mind of the person who wrote the memo. Um, uh, or sent the memo that uh, there had been significant discussion with Glass and Glazier Federation uh, standards. Yeah. Uh, just on the other issue. Oh, yeah. uh, okay, I'll let you in it because you're jumping the queue there. But Sorry. Go ahead, finish <laughs> it off now. Just another um, issue, and yeah, again on the other people who had sought um, meetings. Uh, I take it that uh, once a minister has, because I have received this as well on many occasions. You receive um, an application from somebody to come and talk to you on an issue, and then other people say, oh, we have, we have a view on the same issue. It wouldn't be unusual for a minister to say, well, I've actually heard the issues, or I've taken the issues up, I don't need to meet um, additional people. Would, I mean, would, and would you also maybe just conf or explain to us, um, when it comes to setting up meetings with ministers, that sometimes... Um, a conversation with a special advisor or directly with the minister himself helps to explain what, what a meeting might be more relevant. Absolutely, absolutely. And that's why, and I don't have the facts around why minister decided to, to pick one meeting as opposed to another. Um, I, I can only assume that was the reason behind it. Okay, now I have a number of members indicating looking back on again. So, obviously, in the interest of making sure everybody has their, their, their say. Yeah. Uh, we, we'll do that, so uh, don't worry, your name has been down on the list. Yeah, yeah, but just, I, I mean, two points, Stephen. Uh, there is not one, I mean, because I think this is important, let's go to the bottom of all this. There is not one single letter or memo until the later iterations of the uh, Barbara McConaughey a minute which suggests anything other than the meetings with Targentons. That's wrong. So, no, I'm sorry. No, it's not. Ever. Well, if you look at right. page 17, Chairman, you're... All right. That's let because you've got your own opinions since you started this. Let me finish what I'm saying, Trevor. 
Hello, the meeting. If you want to go to page 17, starts yeah. off attend the meeting yesterday with the manager and target dump builders. It refers to the double glazing and the glass and glazing federation guidelines. Mm -hmm. That's not a difficulty at all. I'm not taking issue with that whatsoever. What I'm pointing out is that throughout a fairly protracted period and a publicly controversial period, but more importantly, business with this assembly and with this committee, there is not one person who gave evidence, in particular, I have to say, of Turgenton Holdings themselves. Uh, there's not one single piece of correspondence which suggests anything otherwise <coughs> than the meeting was with Turgenton. I mean, I, want, I need to establish that for the record. Again, and you accept that. Accept, you accept, accept that. Yeah. And further to that, in the midst of even going into June, when the BBC were contacting yourself, at no time did anybody. And I put this question to the minister himself. At no time did anybody. And when the minister said, at no time did anybody come to him to tell him that his information, as in saying publicly and to this assembly, that the meeting was with the Glazing Federation. Did nobody go to correct him about that? We dealt with this early on with uh, Will Hare, and we'll return to that, and we'll deal with other witnesses. And so, what you're saying is, I mean, you're a special advisor, but a particularly important role, as you understand. Um, so, at no time did anybody ever believe it appropriate to go back to an official or a, 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 the record to say, "Excuse me, Minister, we've got this wrong," because actually, the meeting was with Turkington Holdings. I mean, no, no, we're, no. we're been asked to accept evidence that at no time did anybody ever go back to anybody and say, actually, no. But in fact, the reverse is the case because people have went, even if you follow the Susan McCarty and the Houghton Executive email trail, the Houghton Executive were quite clear the meetings with the Turkington Holdings. Michael Sands was quite clear in his evidence and, and said in his evidence that he was prepared to accept an inaccuracy when he was asked to change the letter to me. As a chair of this committee, which was, was conducted in your handwriting by your evidence here this morning on the instruction of the minister, well, we've been asked to basically accept the premise or the proposition that, despite the fact that there is not a single piece of documentation until the final or last two iterations of Barbara McConaughey's uh, note, that the meeting was with anybody other than the Turgeton Holdings. I accept okay. most of that, Chair. This all goes back to my expectation coming out of the meeting on the 25th of January that a letter was going to be sent to the Minister from the Glass and Glazen Federation requesting a meeting from Ian Young from the Glass and Glazen Federation. If I had seen the letter that arrived at that point, Flags would have been raised in my mind as to who was actually asking for this meeting. <clears throat> if I'd have seen it at the point in April when the meeting was held, flags would have been raised in my mind. I don't believe that letter was part of the pack that Minister got on the day. So even if you're in the meeting, uh, that sometimes you can scuttle through the, the, the submission as and when the meeting's happening. That, I, I didn't see that letter. Um, and, and therefore, up until very recently, I was of the impression and entirely convinced that the meeting was requested on behalf of the Glass and Glazen Federation. Okay, well, as I said, I have a number of people who want to come in. Mickey, then Jim. I would like to thank Stephen because you have said that after the meeting on 25th of January, you were under the impression that uh, there was a letter going to come in from the Glass and Glazen Federation. You also said, and I alluded to it in uh, previous questions, on page 14, the uh, briefing, the pre-meeting, uh, uh, the briefing for the meeting. Um, <clears throat> it says very clearly, um, meeting with Turkington Holdings, it then goes on to the issue of accepting the invitation to meet with Jim McCaig and Ian Young of Turkington Homes. It then goes on about the detail of accepting the invitation to meet with Jim McCaig and Ian Young of Turkington Homes. So whoever um, prepared that briefing, was very clear that it was from Turkington. Presumably, and they must have had access to the letter if they arranged the meeting, uh, etc. Yes. Did it not occur to you? Because I know you had to leave the meeting and it was on a Monday, and you may you said you didn't see this. If um, they were there as Turkingtons, did you not at any stage think? Well, my impression was, and you were present at presumably the initial stages of the meeting. Anyhow, would it not have occurred to you to say, well? 
I, my understanding it was you are here to represent the Glass and Glazing Federation as opposed to Turkingtons, because you were certainly on the impression you stated that, that they were sending in a letter as representatives of the Glass and Glazing Federation. Mm. Now, Declan Allen from the Housing Secretary who also attended that meeting said at no time was he aware that they were from the Glass and Glazing Federation. So, the, the, and the Turkingtons were very clear in their evidence, Jim McCaig and Ian Young, that they had never mentioned it. So you. Well, they did mention it. Well, they said that they never mentioned the fact that they were representing the Glass and Glazing. They did say, yes, they have been members of the Glass and Glazing Federation. The Glass and Glazing person who came over, from, the representative from England, said very clearly that there's a protocol that would have to have been gone through for them to actually represent Glass and Glazing Federation at any know. meeting. Right. So I'm just wondering, would it not have occurred to you at that time to say, well, look. Are you representing Glass and Glazing Federation or are you representing Turkingtons? It's a moot point, but it seems a relatively straightforward issue. Absolutely. In hindsight, probably there would have been a lot of things done differently. No, um, okay. Thank you. Uh, Jim? You know, this meeting of the 25th January, you've already accepted that um, Turkingtons' evidence is to the fact they said nothing that could have left you with the impression that they were representing the, the Federation. Um, yet you asked the committee to believe that you left that meeting believing that they were. Mm -hmm. um, and that's rather inexplicable if yes. their evidence is to be believed. Yes. Um, and you say you expected a letter to come <coughs> from the Federation. From Ian Young. Yes, on behalf of the yes. Federation. At that meeting on the 25th, did you suggest at any time that that's who it should come from? No, they were the ones who brought up the Glass and Glazing Federation. <laughs> I had no knowledge of the Glass and Glazing Federation before this meeting. There's no issue but that the Glass and Glazing Federation's guidelines have been <coughs> part of a lot of these discussions. Yes. Nobody's disputing that. The dispute is <clears throat> who was representing who. Yes. Now, uh, Turkingtons are very clear to this committee in their evidence that they said nothing to you which could cause you to believe that they were representing the Federation. Yet you come to us without any notes at the meeting to tell us that that's the impression you left with. Well, I was it is rather inexplicable. Well, it is, but I was asked by this committee to give a briefing as to what my understanding was of, and you, you'll see the, the expanded version of what I was asked by the committee to provide. I've given that. I mean, I, I can only give that. That, that, that is my belief as to what happened at the time, that was my belief going into the meeting on the 16th or 17th of April, that was my belief up until very recently. But it's not rooted on anything according to Turkington's evidence of what they said to you. And I accept. But you accept that? I accept that. So is it the case, Mr Brimstone, that in a way, <coughs> picking up some dust to try and well, not be the fall guy, but take some of the, to try and provide an explanation as to how the Federation never came into the picture, to soften the blow in respect to the Minister. Is that what you're at? No, not at all. I, I'm providing uh, honest, truthful answers to this committee um, to the best of my ability. Uh, I left the meeting on the 25th of January, at which the Minister was not at, with a clear impression that a letter was going to come from an Ian Young representing the Glass and Glazing Federation to the Minister requesting the meeting. I, after that meeting, went and briefed the Minister on the meeting I had had and told him that I expected a letter to come requesting a meeting of him from an Ian Young from the Glass and Glazing Federation. But that what, impression what, what, wasn't what, based on anything Ian Young had said according to the evidence he gave us. Well, I can only give you my... Or are you calling Ian Young a liar? I'm not calling anybody a liar. Right. I, so I, can I, we believe his answer that they were equally clear when they met you that they were just Turkingtons? I can only give you my impression of what was going to come on the back of that meeting. And I'm just probing how you could possibly have that impression if Ian Young's evidence is to be believed. Well, I clearly was led to believe during that meeting, and it's two years ago now. I was two. Uh, sorry. So, sorry, I thought there was something there. No. Um, I, I was clearly under the impression two years ago that. Uh, this, this letter was going to come from the Glass and Glazing Federation. I was well, clearly under the impression. 
I don't want to labour, but I'm suggesting to you that impression couldn't have come if Mr Young has been believed in his evidence from anything Mr Young or, I, or Mr Turkington said to you at that meeting. Well, I, I can only tell you my impressions leaving that meeting. You say on the 16th of April nothing was discussed except the specifications. Were there no health and safety issues discussed? My, my recollection, the note clearly says that there were health and safety issues discussed. I don't know whether that happened after I left the meeting or not. Um, as I said earlier, I left the meeting early at a personal appointment. Um, so I, I don't know if that was discussed after that or not. Thank you. Oh, uh, just to mean one final point for myself on page 97, Stephen. Clearly, under the impression two years ago that uh, th this <laughs> this letter was going to come from the Glass and Glazen Federation, I was well, clearly I, under the impression. I don't want to labour, but I'm suggesting to you that impression couldn't have come if Mr. Young has been believed in his evidence from anything Mr. Young or, I, or Mr. Turkington said to you at that meeting. Well, I, I can only tell you my impressions leaving that meeting. You say on the 16th of April nothing was discussed except the specifications. Were there no health and safety issues discussed? My, my recollection, the note clearly says that there were health and safety issues discussed. I don't know whether that happened after I left the meeting or not. Um, as I said earlier, I left the meeting early at a personal appointment. Um, so I, I don't know if that was discussed after that or not. Thank you. Oh, uh, just to mean one final point for myself on page 97, Stephen. Um, I mean, I, I mean, I will put this uh, later to to Barbara McConaughey, but this was an email mm -hmm. from Barbara McConaughey on the 22nd of February, mm -hmm. and it relates to a meeting, re-invitation, Turkington Holdings, yeah. attachment, Turkington PDF. Further down the page, we then have reference to invitation from Ian Young Turkington, subject Turkington Holdings. And I mean, I'm looking for some explanation as to why and how any misunderstanding could be around this correspondence and referring to this request and referring to the ultimate meeting. Because here again, we have a complete and utter um, example of how. All of the correspondence relates specifically to Turkington's. So, uh, after I briefed the minister on the meeting with, that I had with Turkington's, I knew I was going to be going off on leave, on paternity leave. My wife was expecting a child any day. Yeah. Um, and I updated the minister's private secretary that I expected a letter to be coming in from the Glass and Glazen Federation. I, I wasn't going to be here whenever this arrived. I had let her know that the minister was keen, following my briefing with him, that he was keen to hear the issues being raised. Yeah. And I had suggested that when that letter arrived in, that the chief executive of the, the housing executive should be at that meeting, as the issues were largely to do with housing executive matters. No, I appreciate that, but I mean, this is 22nd of February. This is, yes. not, this is not April or May or June, for that matter. Perhaps Mr. Burns can tell us when he came back to work. It was two weeks. Uh, sorry, I went off on the 27th, I think it was, off. And, uh, of February. And Fe January? February. So then you were there when the letter came in, it's the 2nd of February? No, but I didn't. All right, I but misunderstand the way the private office works. Yeah. Um, I wouldn't have seen that letter until it came up onto the Minister's you desk. Were, well, Stephen, you were CC'd into this email on the 22nd of February. Yeah. Uh, uh, a total reference, exclusive reference to Turrington Holdings. Absolutely. And if you, if you know the way the email system and the department works, in particular, my, in fact, the department have taken steps to try and do something about it. Uh, there's lots of CC'd emails that I never read. I cannot read them because there are literally hundreds of them. So you didn't read the email and you no, didn't I read I never the briefing. Seen that email. Okay, so you didn't see the, the, the email. You didn't read the letter. You didn't read the briefing. You did read it. Yeah. And your role as a special advisor. Well, I despite all of this editor, I'm mean, repeating this for the third time, despite all of the public attention and, and assembly inquiries and this committee writing and and all of that. Yes. I, I never seen this email, Chair. Um, or I would have seen the attached document attached to the email. Um, anybody will confirm that 
up until recently I was CC'd into hundreds of emails and it was impossible to read them. I mean, all the evidence I've given so far is, is as honest and as clear as I can be. Okay, I have no other indication to uh, speak uh, from any other member at the moment, so I'll be enough to uh, adjourn it, uh, leave it at this uh, juncture, Stephen. So thank you for your, your evidence this morning, and obviously we'll be reflecting on all of this and uh, may well be returning uh, to you for further uh, information. Um, it's now five past one, and we're ready when the, the next particular evidence session, and I just propose to take a 15 minute comfort break. Twenty-nine. Yeah, so we're just inviting in the uh, the next witness to the inquiry. Okay, so the, the, the inquiry is uh, resumed in session. So thank everybody for being here again. And to the extent, I want to welcome now to uh, Ms. McConaughey for this particular evidence session. Uh, Barbara McConaughey is a former private secretary to the Minister for Social Development. I'd just like to acknowledge maybe the questions that I can understand that it can be quite a maybe daunting experience to give evidence to a committee, never mind uh, an inquiry. Um, so I, I want, just want to make sure that from, from the outset that you're comfortable enough in terms of giving your evidence and you'll have an ample opportunity to have your say. You will obviously have questions from the various members, including myself, to address um, relating to your own evidential role in all of this. Um, but as I say, you'll have uh, plenty of time to do that. And I think you've been provided with uh, the relevant documentation from, from the side that we wanted you to kind of specifically deal with. Um, now obviously, it's probably even a little bit more stressful to be required to give evidence under oath. <coughs> In your case, I think I understand you're, you're wanting to take an affirmation. And just to state for the record that obviously both are equal in terms of standing and, and more importantly, legal implications. Um, so, uh, on that basis, uh, I just want to say that in the administering of an oath or requiring a person to give evidence with, uh, by way of, of an affirmation, we are not calling into question anybody's integrity. Uh, we said at the outset that we would take people at their professional integrity at face value, and that's what we've been seeking to do. But, of course, where we get what appears to be a conflict of evidence between people who are presenting evidence, then we are duty-bound then to... Uh, make sure that we are rigorously uh, exploring that. And in this case, therefore, for yourself, as you're aware, Barbara, you had presented uh, the, the inquiry with uh, a submission <coughs> some weeks ago. And then Michael Sands had also then given uh, uh, oral evidence at the, at the inquiry, and there, there's a conflict between the evidence provided. Um, it's not up to us. We haven't made any judgment as to where the inaccuracy might lie, but you understand our position that we have then to, on the basis that we're not treating one person differently than another, or <coughs> anything against one member or one uh, witness, that we in this instance have required both people to be here. As you know, Michael Sands won't be here today due to illness um, to give further evidence under oath or by way of affirmation. Um, so, Without any further ado, as I understand it, just in terms of the housekeeping here um, and good practice, as I understand it, you, you have opted to take a affirmation, opted to make an affirmation, um, as opposed to the oath, which, as I said earlier on, has the same standing. So could I now invite, and I understand that you've been advised by the Department of Officials, the implications of that, as potential legal implications of all of that. 
So on that basis, then I'm happy then if you're happy then that we will uh, initiate the affirmation. And I'll ask Kevin Peelan, the clerk, then to uh, give you a copy of the affirmation, which, which then I will ask you to just let you have a look at it for a moment or two, just so you're comfortable enough for the wording of it. And so if you're so as soon as you're, you're happy enough, just let me know, and then we'll administer that affirmation. That's fine. Go ahead. You happy enough? Yep. Mm -hmm. So could I then formally then, uh, Barbara, then ask you to verbalise the affirmation just for the record to the inquiry? I do solemnly, sincerely and truly declare that the evidence I shall give shall be truthful and honest, and that I will give the committee all such information and assistance as I can to enable it to discharge its responsibilities. <coughs> Okay, thank you. Now, um, so moving ahead then into the, 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 the core of the business, I suppose, just a couple of points I can make before I take members um, uh, in, in order of their request. Um, there, there were there's probably essentially two points that I want to, to make uh, to address with yourself, Barbara. On the one hand, uh, Stephen Brimstone earlier on had indicated that he had advised, I think yourself, that to expect an, uh, an invitation or a letter from uh, what he described as a class in uh, Glazing Federation. But your the emails, I think, on page 97. <coughs> it looks to us. So, first of all, could you advise us how we were you advised by Stephen? expect a letter from the Glazen Federation? Yes, I do recall um, a conversation that Stephen had with me to expect a letter coming in from the Glass and Glazen Federation. But your email on the 22nd of February relates entirely and exclusively to Turkington's? Yes, I think when the invitation actually came in, my interpretation when I read that was that the meeting was from Turkington's, so that's therefore the reason why I had interpreted that it should be a meeting with Turkington's. Yeah, no, I think that's clear because the, the letter does indicate <laughs> clearly it was from Turkington. So I'm, I'm just trying to just to establish this for accuracy. So, um, but can, can I ask you, how would you then, I mean, obviously you saw the letter from Turkington's. Um, how then was it agreed that Turkington's meeting would go ahead? Did you, did you advise, because obviously if you've been advised by the special advisor, to expect a letter from the Glazen Federation and that that meeting should go ahead. But if you got a letter from Turkington's, would you have made a judgment? Well, it's the same thing, really. And or or what, why would you have made a determination? Because obviously you receive other letters, and other requests were denied. So basically, I have to go on what's what was written, you know. And at that time, Stephen was actually off, I believe, on paternity leave, so he wasn't around to actually clarify. So the fact that the letter came in from Turkington's, it was. Um, it's recorded on our knowledge network system as an invitation case, and that is sent out to the branch then for advice. For the, for the minister as to whether he should accept or decline the invite. But Stephen didn't go off until the 27th, which is five days after the 22nd email. Uh, well, I, I oh. honestly can't recall okay. the details, but as far as I know, Stephen wasn't around for me to clarify with him. But for the normal procedure for me when I receive an invitation is to have it logged on the system okay. and sent out to officials for advice. Okay. Right. And, and, and you're... Just right. sorry to say as well, like sometimes there's maybe conversations go on outside of what I would be privy to, you know, and things can move on. So, you know, there's no reason for me to question where the letter or where the invitation was coming from or it was any different, you know. Could, can you, I mean, we received evidence from the department on actually the 6th of January, which um, gives us a, a schedule of amendments to the 16th of April, uh, your, your aid memoir, your, I'm not sure why we call this a minute or an aid memoir, but we should call it one or the other, so we'll, we'll just we'll, we'll remember to be able to call that a minute. I don't mind, it's, it's a toss-up, it's an aid memoir or a minute. Um, so, so the only thing, I, mean, I have no real issue with that, but I think just speaking back a few meetings ago, there was reference a minute. If it wasn't a minute, it would have been circulated. And because it wasn't circulated, I think we should be referring to it as a memoir. I think only for procedural purposes, to be honest. But well, the minister started. repeatedly referred to it as a minute. He may have done. He, he might have done, evidence, Chairman. Yeah. But, but we did hear that it's normal practice like that it's a minute, that it's circulated to all those who are present. Now, we did take an awful lot of weight from Turkington's and what they've said. 
They said they didn't get a copy of the Aid Memoir, so I don't think we can call it a minute. No, OK, I'm, I'm, I'm easy, but I mean, we can probably interchange the term because we maybe <coughs> don't have to agree as such. But um, in, in respect of that, uh, there have been a number of changes uh, to that, and I think a total of six. Uh, and on the f up until the fifth the Aid Memoir iteration, Michael Sands, for example, had been recorded as having made two amendments. And then you've been recorded as having, um, I'm trying to get my page, is this 100 and... Page 70. It's 69, is it? Yeah, page 70. Page 70. We have a number of changes made according to this table that we've provided, and that's on page 70, is it? Page 70, Barbara. The number is actually clipped on my page here, so it's. Mm -hmm. You have seven. Have you got? So it's just. Um, I'm sure Barbara has that. So again, uh, and Michael Sands' evidence, he had said that he had not seen this at any time. But this schedule appears to well, it indicates clearly that Michael Sands, on the 17th of April, added uh, to the list of attendees. And then on version five, it was amended with the track changes which people have. And then it goes on to say that the finalised version changes from version five, <coughs> six were made by you. In your written submission, if I remember correctly, you said you had not seen any of that until the fourth of the final version. So what we're interested in establishing here is in the first instance, from the, the, the version 5 to the version 6, the two significant changes of concern to this committee are that the name of the, the organisation that was holding the meeting was changed from Target Tons to the Class and Gleason Federation. And then further down that letter, it changes uh, Target Tons and again replaces that with the Gleason Federation. Can you explain <coughs> why, according to this schedule, you made that change? From the outset, um, I know it says there's actually six versions, but maybe it'd be worthwhile to explain that when I actually go in to draft um, or take it from the manuscript to put it on an electronic version, <coughs> if I go out of that at all, that will save that as a version. Yeah. So even though if I just make sort of a couple of minor mistakes, it's, it's cast as a, as a draft. Um, once I had recorded my um, interpretation of the meeting, that would have been sent obviously to Michael Sands, and he would have had sort of responsibility to make any amendments. The reason that that's sent to Michael is really just to number one, make sure it's a, an accurate reflection of what happened at the meeting, yep. and number two is to follow up then on any action that would come out of the meeting. Yep. Um, Michael made his changes, and then, as you say, I did change it, but. In all honesty, I cannot recall at this point as to who or why I made changes to that final version. Um, the role that I have as PS was extremely, extremely busy. Um, I would have been sucking or been acceding to requests from various people from you know, various parts of the department, whether it be urban regeneration or housing or social security agency. And to recall, to go back and recall specifically why I made the change to this one, unfortunately, I can't. I, I can't. Would you agree that in your previous written evidence you, you said that uh, you would not normally be asked to make such changes? So would it not be reasonable for us to expect that it was not normal for you to do that when you were asked to make changes, but you then made those changes? And could I suggest that they're not minor changes, they're significant changes? So, yeah. you're asking us to accept that you can't recall what would have been a, a very unusual transaction. Yeah. Well, as I said, I, on a daily basis, I have got a number of requests to, you know, like change submissions, briefings, maybe you know, correspondence cases, invitations cases, and amongst a, a <coughs> wide range of of correspondence, I can't honestly recall the specific details around this. In my role, um, I would say I maybe was attending maybe 25 minutes, well, 25 meetings, sorry, 
a week, which you know, on average is about a thousand a year, and I was PS2 Minister McCausland for four years. So, you know, amongst four thousand meetings and amongst dealing daily with a number of submissions, number of correspondence cases, street official cases, general mail cases, I I can't honestly recall the specific details. Can you recall any other occasion when you would have changed a diary entry? The minister. Well, again, I would have been in the diary very, very regularly. It would have been part of my role. Would have been sort of monitoring the diary and um, keeping it up to date. And again, you know, the diary could have changed at the last minute. And to be in the diary for me was not. You know, that's a regular part of that was the daily part of my duties. But the question is, I mean, you change the diary, Andrew, to reflect a different meeting. As I would describe that. So, can you explain how? Usually that might be. There's one thing looking at a diary and so on and so forth, but they actually went to a diary and a month later, when it was put in, they actually changed it. Yeah, and would that not seem unusual? Well, um, again, I can't recall the details of why the diary was changed, but um, it's not unusual for me to go into a diary and do it retrospectively. Again, that could be the ad, sort of if there was briefing for the event or for the meeting and that wasn't actually attached to the diary. It could have been maybe just to ensure that the records were up to date and try and update who was at the meeting, or maybe if the meeting, you know, the venue changed at the last minute, you know, it could have been to go in to update, you know, that part of it. But I, I don't recall the actual details of what I changed. Well, again, you're 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 asking us to accept that uh, you made what are significant changes to. Uh, in the end memoir, and you also change the diary and <coughs> respectively. But you have no understanding at all how that made a problem for did anybody request that. And <coughs> the key question I want to ask here is that with the distribution list on that end memoir, there are a relatively small number of people who received that from yourself. So who among those people would have had the authority? But I can narrow this down a little bit to help recall here. Um, who among that group of people would have been able to have the authority to come back and say, actually, no, that's who we met? Well, because, um, I mean, you have to help. I think you have to help us out here. And yes, and and and, and, I, and I am to the best of my ability, but I obviously don't want to say anything that's going to implicate somebody wrongly either. But you have to give us your best recollection. Yes. Uh, it's not a question of doing anybody any wrong. This is about following. Evidence. And this is about following people's. I mean, we have heard people giving evidence here this morning that they had a clear recollection of something which clearly was incorrect, but they gave it as their recollection. Um, so I would suggest to you that if you have a recollection, you can put that and you can qualify it however way you think it's appropriate. But this is not about not doing anybody wrong or doing anybody right. This is about us exploring the evidence, as we have said, as Mary said, that we are determined to do, and we will get to the bottom of it. So, could I suggest, if you are unsure about something, you might actually volunteer that information and caveat that as you see fit, yeah, yeah. as opposed to saying, well, I am not sure, so I am not going to say, because that is what I am interpreting that as. I know. The, well, the person that could have authorised or instructed me to change um, anything probably would have been the minister or the special adviser, or it could have possibly been somebody from... Um, the housing, a senior housing official. As in, well, it could have it could have been Michael, although I'm not sure that it would have been Michael because I think he was under the impression that the meeting was, tur was with the Turpentons. Yeah, and also that there wouldn't have been any other officials at the meeting. You know, well, the housing executive, for example, weren't asked. Did they have also in their and said they had no side of it? So no, because it was just a bit memoir. But really, the, 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 the idea behind um, this is more of a. Was to keep me correct if there was any follow up action so that I had a, an internal document that I could go back to um, and, and follow up on. You know, so the, 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 the note wasn't circulated to those people who were at the meeting. And could you uh, maybe offer some explanation as to how that if you received a letter from Turkingtons and recorded that as such in your email and in fact distributed that email to a number of people? Uh, that how, after even as this table shows us that Michael Sands, for example, <coughs> as one of the people who may have been able to make a change, made two changes, that 
in the finalised version we get which the only explanation we have at this moment in time is that you change that. So at this moment in time you have to provide an explanation as to why you change that. Well I'm and assuming if you know what I mean. So yeah. you have to offer us some rationale as to why you changed the reference to who the meeting was with and why you did that, despite the fact that you had a letter from Turkington. Yeah. Well, I, I, I'm assuming that the instruction come from either the minister or the special advisor, since they were under the impression that the meeting was with the Glass and Basin Federation. And you can't offer any explanations to how that was conveyed to you. Did somebody come in to you? Did somebody send you an email? Did somebody phone you up? Did somebody stop you in the office and say, by the way, you need to see that? I honestly don't recall the incident at all. And again, as I said before, I would have received numerous requests. I could have been, you know, it's a very, very busy post. But it, is, it is your job, it is your post to do that. It is my job to, um, you know, accede to requests and, you know, to reprioritise my work. And, you know, in the middle of attending meetings and maybe answering the telephone and dealing with officials. Like sometimes you just become sort of almost automatic or robotic in, in what you do. You know? Okay, Jim Oliver. Uh, just explain to us the chain of command in the private office. You're the private secretary to the minister. Yes. But what's the hierarchy? Who can tell you what to do and who can't? Well, I obviously have my line manager at D DP level. Um, oh. I also have, and then on top of that, there would have been the grade seven um, ahead of the DP. Um, yeah, can you put names on those? Those. Yes, if you need to be yeah. my my line manager at that time was Billy Crawford, right. and the grade seven ahead of Billy then would be um, Alistair Newell, yes. and that would have been my um, hierarchy in terms of line management. Okay. But in terms of your role as private secretary. That was to the minister. Obviously, you would take his instructions. Yes. Would you equally take the special advisor's instructions? If the special advisor had asked me to do something, yes, I need, yes. Uh -huh. So he had that status uh, to tell you what to do or not do? Well, obviously, it, de it depended on, the, on, on what the requests are as well, you know. But yes, if the, if the special advisor had asked me to do something, you know, for me, he is a, a more senior member of, of staff than what I am. Uh, and dealing with the two Pacifics on the one day, remind you it was the one day, the 16th of May 2012, the retrospective change of the diary entry to change who the meeting was with, and the change to the minutes to show, to change who the meeting was with. It both happened on the 16th of May. Can you give any indication as to why both those matters were addressed on the same day? Again, I, I, I can't recall actually doing this, so therefore it's hard for me, you know, I, I, I can't recall actually going and changing this specifically. But you accept you did make those changes? Well, the evidence is there that I made the changes, yes. Previously, your statement to us suggested you maybe didn't, but you now accept you did. Is that right? Did I say that? I don't, I don't in recall saying that I didn't. In your, in, your, in your submission to us, you said that uh, on page 101. Said that you were not normally required to make amendments, and you don't want to say that uh, you had only said it was a final version when it was provided to you by the Dal. This morning, this, today, in your evidence, you're saying you made the changes, but you can't recall why you made them. So that's conflict. You don't understand where we're coming from. Well, you're, you're conflicting your well, evidence. Sorry, what, what, what I meant in this actual paragraph here of the written submission was. Based on the evidence I had, I was the last one that actually recorded on the on the minute that I made the changes on the basis of version that you know was provided to me. Yes, I accept that I done that. However, could I just say, you know, if somebody had provided me a, a separate version of a minute and said you were the last person to change that, well then, you know, I would have accepted that. Well, let's be clear. Your evidence to us is that you didn't make either of those changes to the diary or to the heading on the minute of your own volition. 
Is that right? No, Someone I'm not told denying. you to do it. Yes, I'm not denying. I made the changes. Yes, I'm not, I'm not quibbling yes. that. I'm asking you, did you do it of your own volition in either or both cases, or did somebody tell you to do it? I would have done it under instruction. Under instruction. So the question now is, help us where you can as to who would have given that instruction. Well, at, the, at this point, I cannot recall who exactly gave me the instruction to change that. Right. Mrs McConaughey, you've already said to us in your, in your written statement that being asked to change minutes was unusual. It wasn't something you were normally doing. So the very fact of its unusualness would cause, would it not, for it to somewhat stick out in your memory? Well, well no, because as I said before, I would have made numerous changes on a daily basis to various documents, not just, you know, it would have been ministerial submissions, there would have been ministerial correspondence, there would have been treat officials' cases coming up, and I, I could be making changes to any of but, those but documents. But you were changing something here that coloured the trail in respect of this meeting. This was, <clears throat> as I said earlier, rewriting the script of who the meeting was with. It was as fundamental as that, wasn't it? The diary was being changed to say meeting with Turkington's to meeting with Turkington's representing Glass and Glazing Federation. That's the change that was made there. The heading change that was made on the minutes was meeting scrub Turkington's meeting with Glass and Glazing Federation. That was the commonality of the change. It was fundamental to the trail of who the meetings was with. They were made on the same day. One of them we know made at 12.32, just before lunchtime, I imagine. Um, don't get lunch. lunch. Don't get lunch. <laughs> Notional lunchtime, right. Uh, now, are you seriously saying to us that in those circumstances where you're asked to change not one but two documents for the same purpose, and the purpose being quite dramatic in terms of changing who the meeting was with, that you cannot help us about who asked you to do that? Well, on, on hindsight now and, and the fact that this inquiry has opened, yes, I can see how it is a big factor do you know what I mean? But at the time, it didn't, it didn't mean anything to me that I was changing something like that. Well, but on hindsight now, yes, I can see that it is something that I, it should have been sticking in my mind. But, it, but it, it meant this to you. You had seen the 2nd of February letter asking for the meetings in a, unequivocally. It was from Turkington's. You'd seen the pre-meeting briefing unequivocally with Turkington's. You were at it. Uh, Turkington's evidence is they never represented themselves as anyone but Turkington's. And now suddenly, one month later, after the meeting, you're asked to rewrite the script of who the meeting was with. So it was quite striking, was it not? Well, I fully accept what you're saying, but you know, as I, as I said before, there's conversations go on outside of my role as a PS. I'm only yes. a very small cog in the wheel. You know, and if there's conversations going on and things move on yes. and I'm asked to change something, yes. I obviously think it's because maybe I've got the wrong end of the stick or, you know... I'm not asking you to, to, to discern why you were asked to make a change. I'm asking you to focus very strongly on who asked you to make the change on the same day for the same doc for, uh, on two different documents. I'm sure that you could help us. If, if I could, I would. I honestly can't. Oh, did you see the minister on the 16th of May? If you checked back, was he in the country? Was he in Stormont? Where was he? Have you checked any of that? Sorry. This is just ask a question. Oh, sorry. sorry, Barbara. 14. I just need to ask one question at a time, please. And Have you sought to check if you saw the minister on the 16th of May? No, I haven't because I do not have access. I've, I've since moved post and I don't have access to private office registers. Just going back to the manuscript copy of the minutes that you took, where did the manuscript copy go to? Well, after I do the manuscript copy and then I put it on as an electronic version, it's, it's, it's shredded. There's no reason for me to keep that. So it was shredded? If I was to keep all <coughs> those minutes... And let's be quite clear, you wrote up that first minute as a meeting with Turkington. 
Is that right? Correct. And the subsequent, very uh, the subsequent versions of that minute until the last one were all proclaiming it to be with Turkington's. Isn't that right? And then someone said to you, change that from Turkington's to Glass and Glazing Federation. And you can't help us as to who that was. You know, as Stephen said, he interpreted that the meeting was with the Glass and Glazing Federation. So let's worry about what he interpreted. Can you tell us as to who told you to do it? Unfortunately, I can't recall. Are you taking refuge in that? Many times he asks the same question. Can, I, got that repair, can, I, can I actually, just at this juncture, because I think it's where we're making it. I think he's in court. I think he's making it. Oh. All right, Trevor. Just, all right. Oh, just People, every member around this table is entitled to ask questions, providing those questions are not bothering anybody and they're giving the witness ample time to answer. And equally that they stay within the terms of reference. And I know it's going to be a wee bit difficult, but I mean, we've, we've managed, I think, this inquiry mm. quite well thus far. Um, and hopefully, on a professional basis, we'll continue to do that. But you know, we are here to probe questions and answers, and explore evidence that's been presented to us, particularly when that conflicts. And unfortunately, we have evidence which conflicts. Mm. That's the difficulty we have, which is why people were called this morning here to give evidence, either on their oath or by way of affirmation. And I mean, and I want to underline just again the importance of that because we have had we have had evidence from both the minister and Stephen Brimstone here this morning. We both said they had no role in changing that version of the minute. No role. So that means in your evidence that, and you've accepted that you changed it, and you're saying obviously you would have changed it by way of instruction or whatever. You're not quite sure by whom, but your evidence is telling us at this moment in time that you changed it, and a number of the people, Michael Sands included. He's not here, but in his evidence he said he had never even saw it, uh, despite what the evidence has now thrown up to the contrary, mm. but nevertheless, and we'll, we'll address that with Michael in due course, but in his evidence, which is all we can deal with, he had said very clearly that he saw no aid memoir and never made any changes. Both the Minister and Stephen Brimstone have both said in their evidence to this inquiry that they didn't make the changes. So you've accepted you have made the changes, and you've offered up that it may have been a limited number of those individuals who you named. Do you understand the decision that you now stand in? If you're standing and making a, a declaration that you've made a change to a document and others are saying that they had no role in that. So, again, you've been put on the spot, I would suggest, mm -hmm. to explain. Chairman, when, when does badgering not become badgering? Whenever a question has been asked a number of times, and the, member, and, the, and the person giving the witness here has said she can't remember. Yeah. Now, as well as that, and I mean, I, I agree with you, there is, there is a shadow over Michael Sands' evidence, but now you're actually accepting what he has said to try and badger the witness even further. I, I'm not accepting. I, I'm not doing? accepting. It's not my job to accept anybody's evidence. My job is just to moderate the conduct of this inquiry. The members of this committee... Oh, Chairman, you're going oh. further. With respect, you're mm -hmm. going further than that. Someone has sat here and told you, and I don't think you fully understand what a private secretary has to do on a day-to-day -day basis. We have received evidence here today, and in fact I think it's been underplayed, <coughs> as to the pressures which are on somebody who has a PS role on a day-to-day -day basis. She has indicated that she cannot remember, on a number of occasions, she cannot remember who... Um, if anyone gave an instruction, and to choose a name out of the names which have been suggested will have severe implications for the individual who she happens to choose. Now, you and this committee have to then accept that if the witness decides that she cannot remember and she is not prepared to take pot luck in a busy day to decide who may have given that instruction because of the implications that would have and because she wants to try and, as honestly as possible, answer the question, then there is no it, it, it amounts to badgering for you or anyone else in this committee to say, give us a name. And that's what you're doing. Well, <coughs> at no point, sorry, I'll just take your members in their turn. At no point am I saying to 
Ms McConaughey that she's to give a name. At no point have I said that, and the record will show. Uh, what I am obliged to do, as as is every other member, is to explore the evidence, and when we have a conflict, you're past exploring the evidence, Mr. No, Chairman. Not. I'm sorry, we're not. You are past no, exploring not. the evidence because you're you've had I don't know many times, and you've had a perfectly good explanation as to why the the information may not be forthcoming, and I don't know many times you've been told the information is not forthcoming, so you can keep asking the question, and asking the question, and demanding a name or asking for a name, and that becomes badgering. If the witness has given you, and it's not that the witness has not given good reason as to why a, a name cannot be recalled. And I guarantee, if somebody asked you to remember, and you, you probably don't do half of what a private secretary has to do in a, in a private office. If somebody asked you to, re, to recall every conversation you had and every instruction you got two years ago on, on, on a specific day, you couldn't remember either. No, that's fair enough, and uh, that's not the point we're making here. And I will stand over the procedural fairness which guides the conduct of this inquiry from A to B, and it'll be up to anybody, in particular witnesses. And I've made it very clear I understand the difficulty would be for any witness, including the minister, who would be a well-experienced political representative, to be here to give evidence. I accept that and acknowledge all of that, but we are here to follow what we hear, and. Uh, it will uh, be up to every person, uh, particularly those who are required to give evidence, to be able to challenge if they are considering the Durban treated badly. So, you know, let's be uh, fair and reasonable. The conduct of this inquiry thus far has been, in my view, held uh, quite professional, and that will pertain until this inquiry concludes. I will not be making judgment on anybody's evidence. This committee, in its entirety, <coughs> will deliberate on what we hear. What we are duty bound to do here is to explore what we hear, and I am simply, and I feel it very appropriate to make uh, Ms McConaughey aware that she has given her evidence, and I am reminding her of other evidence which is presented by the people that she has suggested may have directed her, that they have both said to this inquiry that they did not. So I am just making that point. <coughs> may or may not wish to comment on that. That is entirely a matter for you. You are not being coerced to make any comment at all. So, I mean, you want that, to refer that's to the point I was coming to, um, that you've just touched upon. Yes, Mr. McConaughey, you identified three possible instructors, Minister Spad, uh, Mr. Sands. As the Chairman has pointed out, each of those at various stages have denied to us that they were involved at all in any of these changes. I simply want to give you the opportunity, in light of that, have you anything further to say about how these changes came about? I have nothing really further to add than what I have already said. I would have been instructed to have made the changes. I would not have done it off my own bat. Um, but at this point, I can't remember who instructed me to make the changes. Look at page 71 of the bundle, would you? And I have that's been put in <laughs> upside down. But um, it says meeting with attendees, Minister McCausland and Barbara McConaughey. What's that referring to? Sorry, the 71. Right, that is the first draft. That would be my first attempt is actually trying to write up the minutes. As I was sort of trying to explain earlier on, I'm trying to do the minutes yeah. in the middle of doing meetings, doing yeah. telephone calls, and my normal duties. So, so does that mean that the minister was there when you were doing that, and you showed them to him, discussed them with him, or what does that mean? No, that was me starting. That was me starting to draft the minutes. And why does it say attendee, Minister McCausland? Because Minister McCausland was at the meeting. Yes, but so were. Half a dozen other people. Yeah, yeah, but I'm just start. It was just me starting to draft the minutes. I must have got called away to do something. Yeah. So that was the first version of those minutes. Oh, I see. That's so as far as you got. That's as far as I got when I started to do the minutes or the eight memoir or whatever you want to call it. And all subsequent versions, of course, you're not the second person listed for what it matters. Not that it really matters, but I'm no, just. Well, the process that I used to actually sort of to start to type my minutes is I would have probably have copied a previous. Minute. So I obviously was deleting those 
people that weren't at the Do you know what I mean? I was, I was yeah. copying a previous minute, deleting all the information that wasn't appropriate, and that was all the information that was appropriate at that time. So that's the first extent of version one, two names. Yeah. Well, I was obviously called away to another meeting or something. Yeah. That was all I got. That's what you yeah. mean, you went out of the system or whatever. Yeah, I understand. And in terms of the uh, what was referred to as the trim system, were the minutes on that system? Yes, the trim version holes, that's what that is. That was obviously my first attempt. So and who, who has access to that? Well, um, trim can be accessed by um, anybody really in the, in the department, in DSD. The special advisor told us he couldn't access it. Does that surprise you? No, that's. I think as far as I remember, that is correct. That's correct. And the reason for that is, as far as I recall, there was some sort of guidance, possibly from OFMDFM at that point, to say that special advisors were not allowed to access sort of previous correspondence from previous ministers, etc. So they don't have oh, access yeah. to trim. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Understand. Please, Um. Do, do you know anything about the instruction issued to, uh, at the end of June to the <coughs> housing executive that the meeting, in fact, was with the Grazing Federation? No. You had no involvement in that? Had you any contact? Sorry, one final question. Had you any contact with the Department of Finance and Personnel about the meeting, given that the request letter was CC'd to DFB? Thank you. Okay, mm -hmm. Mickey, really? Yeah, <clears throat> Mr. Wilson has alluded to the how busy the private secretary is, and I, I fully accept that. And I think we all would accept it's a difficult job, and you're multitasking and all of that. But I would presume you're doing that job because you're efficient, and you're capable of doing it. I mean, that may be an unfair compliment, but you know, you, you'd have to be good what you do. Otherwise, presumably. You would be in that position, and it would be accepted that you're very, very capable of doing that. <coughs> just, just to make that point. Uh, two questions, really. Um, the dairy changes. You mentioned that dairy changes can be made retrospectively, but I would presume that that's to reflect accurately the meeting. And yet, in the first five versions of the um, Ed memoir or the stroke minute, uh, it says very clearly turkey tongue. And then the last version and the amended version on the diary says <coughs> glass and glazing federation. So obviously that change came about when somebody had to presumably initiate that change. And I, I do accept that you have said that you have no recollection of that. The other question you may not be able to answer, but it's a kind of a general query. On page fourteen there's a briefing um, uh, which was for the meeting, um, and Stephen Brimstone has said he didn't see that until the actual day. It, it was done on the 11th of April 2012, and the talks about Turkin, meeting with Turkin and Holmes, and you accepted an invitation to meet with Jim McKagan and young Turkington Holmes. Now, I would assume that's not part of your remit, but would you have any idea who would normally prepare those briefings? Because it was uh, inferred this earlier um, by Mr. Brimstone it would probably be a, a departmental official. Um, because there would be no need, presumably, for you necessarily to have a copy of that at the meeting, because you're there to get the memoir of the minutes or whatever. And that would be your function at the meeting to accurately reflect well, the, the content the, of the meeting. Um, the housing officials, they prepare the briefing and they send it up to the private office and then the private office would prepare a briefing pack for the minister and I actually would have a copy of this myself as well. Yeah, yes. but would you accept then that on the face of that briefing it was very clear that the meeting was with Turkington Holdings and not the Glass and Glazing Federation, just from the side of that? Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Sharon. Thanks, Barbara. Um, your evidence. Can I just clarify from my own uh, point of view in, in the versions on page 78? You know the way some of the lines ha are underlined and some of them are scored out. You know why would that be? And who would have? I mean, is that something that you would have done on, on your comp own computer system, or would that have been 
something. Normally, when I do up the, the, the draft version, I would send it out for officials and ask them to track changes on it, so it gives me an idea just of what has been changed on it. So that would be automatically done by the, the system using that sort of facility. So that's what track changes look like within your system, basically. Yes. Okay. You know, some people use a wee box at the side type of thing, and so that would be the track changes facility. Uh -huh. uh, and um, I note. Uh, there's a line under uh, Michael Sands' name in the uh, track changes in version five. Why would that be? Is that just is that the first time he's been added to the? In yes, the uh, I uh, omitted him when I was doing it. Unfortunately, yeah. so he was just. That's in version four, sorry, as well. Yeah, but uh, so that just then continued through. And and who would have advised of those track changes being required? Well. Um, when I had sent my version of my interpretation of the meeting to the official, I would have said to them, would you mind tracking the changes on that? That would be Michael. So Michael would have just you know, used that facility. It just gives me an indication as to yeah. what was different from my version, really. No, no, that, 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 that's fine. And uh, Barbara, I note in, in your um, briefing, and you also made reference to the fact that you're no longer a private secretary. Where are you working now? I'm working in the Regional Development Office um, based in Ballymena. Um, it's closer to home for you. Exactly, I yes. thought I heard about the Ballymena twang there. Yes. Given all <laughs> I demand from Upright and Ravel. So. I'm actually Ballymoney. So Ballymoney, so it's handy. Yeah. Uh, and you're not no longer working as a private secretary then? No. So I gave up the post um, last January, January 2013. What post do you hold then now? At the minute, I'm working no. in the Regional Development Office. Oh, just in the Regional Development Office. All right. I don't, I don't know what. I mean, that really wouldn't have any relevance to that. I was just interested no. <laughs> to see when it said you were no longer. I didn't know whether you'd left the service overall or whether you were still well, it's within. It's a matter of interest then. It's yeah. beyond your own time. So. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. Sorry about that. Well, fair enough. I'm but just, um, I'm just trying to keep it. No, no, that's fair enough. And uh, they. Um, I, I, I think um, you would appreciate from others' perception, you know, that given that <coughs> you've said in your own evidence that. The uh, changes are extraordinary rather than run of the mill, and except and you have a very busy day and all the rest, then you can, you can anticipate, uh, uh, understand why others would think, well, if it's an extraordinary thing to happen, that you wouldn't then have a better recollection. You know, because uh, at these evidence sessions, chair, we, we've heard a lot of lecturing and badgering uh, allegedly, and uh, memory loss allegedly. You know, so there are some common themes emerging throughout the, the course of the inquiry, but. In terms of all of these uh, changes and the uh, freedom of information requests and the assembly member questions, you, you would have no role in any of those, or uh, would you be able to? Uh, th those dates, how do they sit? And I think Chair Barber is not able to tell us, and I expect you might not be, uh, that we could find out. You know, in terms of uh, the time scale, in terms of freedom of information requests and assembly questions in relation to those changes, that that might be useful for us to have. You know, in the terms of the six versions. Sorry, what page? On page uh, seventy. 70. Uh, uh, in relation to all of those uh, changes, it would be interesting to know how they relate to requests, either by way of assembly <coughs> members' questions or FOI requests. You may not. What I'm trying to say is, you might not have knowledge. But from my perspective, I think it would be useful if we could add to that uh, mm -hmm. chronological. Uh, time scale in relation uh, to those. Um, and then, uh, Barbara, uh, obviously the chairman was trying to just uh, uh, inform you of how others have said that they would not have any role in amending um, any of the minutes, but uh, as I understand, that's not what you have said. You know, both the minister and indeed the special advisor could suggest amendments. That would be correct. And it would, that would not be unusual. It would be unusual, no. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thanks. Barbara, I, I have some sympathy with the point you've made about not remembering, but because at a point, and it might be useful just for the committee to know in a bit more detail what a day for a private secretary is like, um, you know, with a minister. Maybe you just you know, elaborate on the, ki the kinds of things that. Well, well all you know, tell me, you know, well, it's, it's it's relevant. Relevant. Well, well, work and work well. hard. There's nobody taking exception of that. No, it's relevant. No, no I think it's relevant to. to no, well, it, it is relevant to. Job. It is relevant to ability to recall detail. That's the point I'm making, and I think it would be useful, Barbara, just to hear the kinds of things that a private 
doors on a daily basis. Well, on, on a daily basis, you could be starting work for meetings at 8 o'clock in the morning. And during the course of the day, you could be attending maybe six or seven meetings a day. Um, on top of that, you're dealing with um, a, a DSD department. You have not only um, housing, you have urban regeneration, you have social security agency, you have um, the child maintenance and enforcement division. You also have all the policy documents. Um, so on top of all that information coming into private office, um, you know, you could also be dealing with sort of um, changing diaries at the last minute. Um, if the minister's running late, it's, you know, about um, sort of changing diaries and things to try and get, um, really to sort of bring things on track and that. So it's, it's, it's a really, really busy day. You're exceeding to requests from other MLAs. You know, you're, you're dealing with the permanent secretary and sort of like senior officials. And that is on a daily basis. That's something that happens every day. Do you know what I mean? So um, you do go into a case of working almost automatic pilot at some cases. You know, I could have been working until maybe about 8 o'clock at night, and then again I still had maybe an hour and 20 minutes to go home. So it's, it's an extremely busy post, and forgive me if I don't remember every single detail of what I did. You know. uh, um, see, just in relation, uh, 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 I think it is hard to encapsulate, actually. I know, because I think private societies work far harder than ministers, by the way, but I'll, I'll leave them aside. Um, the, it, it's hard to encapsulate just the kind of pressures and, and therefore the, the, the difficulty in remembering detail. But see, when we come to the changes in the, in the minute you asked we made, would it have been unusual, given that there were still liberal references to turking tongues in this, for you to have thought that actually changes the significance of this uh, minute, that this, you know, if a request was made for those changes? Well, like, as, I, as I said earlier, like, you know, when Stephen had said to me about you know, the possibility of a letter coming from the glass and glazing, you know, that was, there was, I think there was maybe some confusion maybe from my perspective, because I'm not sure, you know, did the meeting move on? Was there conversations to, you know, happened outside of the meeting that I'm not aware of, even with officials? So, you know, Turkington's and glass glazing, yes, I know that there, there's a difference in... Um, it, it does affect sort of the minute, but in my mind, I wasn't aware of the conversations that are happening outside of that. And there were still plenty of references to Turkington's in the minute, as it stands, anyhow, yes, uh -huh. even in the last version. Yes. I think that there are three references to Turkington's in, in, um, in the opening and in the last paragraph of the, um, uh, the, the, the letter. Um, You have been, um, and I can understand it, reticent about asking who uh, made the, the, the uh, who asked to, uh, for the change to be made. Um, and again, given the, the, the business of the, of, of the office, would that be unusual? I mean, could, if, if on a day to day, <coughs> if someone came in and asked for some changes, would, would it be unusual for you to remember who the other individual happened to be, anyhow? I couldn't remember I actually and forgive me but I do actually have a bad memory and for me part of my role whenever I was actually in private secretary I would have had different mechanisms for recording and reminding me to do things whether that be you know using sort of the diary using post-it notes you know using follow-up um, you know even just on the Microsoft Outlook you know to sort of bounce up and say you need to do this you know taking copious notes was my way of um, sort of trying to remember what happened at particular meetings. So, you know, my memory's bad anyway, but for somebody to come in and ask me to do something, you do it almost automatically because you, you, you know what has to be done. Sometimes things have to be done because they're urgent. And for me, my role is to do the, my job to the best of my ability and let the people that it affects know that if, you know, something has been done, you know, that it's been done for a reason. Okay, I just, I mean, I don't have any other members, just a, a couple of points just to finish off on myself. I mean, you've accepted, you've presented evidence that you actually made the changes both to the minute and the diary entry. You, you have confirmed that? Yes. Uh, and as I pointed out early on, 
you also said that you would not have done that your own village and you would have done that under some type of direction. I can't remember where that direction came from. I did point out to you that all the other people who gave evidence pertinent to that actually said it wasn't them. So can you then offer any explanation or I mean, would you have had any personal motivation to change it yourself? Because if we follow what other people are saying, mm -hmm. they didn't do it, so you did it for some reason or other. So can you give us a reason? I mean, would you have had any personal motivation to change the minute? I have absolutely no personal motivation to change the minute. I, um, I would have done it under instruction. There is no reason for me to go in to, to, to change it unless I was instructed to do it. Okay. okay thank you for that. No other member uh, indicating to speak. Barbara, could I thank yourself uh, for being here this, this afternoon to give your evidence? Thank you. Uh, okay, members, just uh, to, I suppose, to sum up where we are at the minute, we, we had, prior to Christmas, we had agreed that uh, as early as we can do, uh, we would reflect, take stock, if you like, where we're at, at phase one of this particular inquiry. And we need to do that for two reasons. One, we need to, need to really literally do take stock where we're at in terms of the evidence that we've heard thus far and what steps we need to take uh, uh, next to, if you like, conclude on phase one. We also then need to reflect on what uh, type of things we want to deal with uh, moving into phase two of the inquiry. And that will then allow uh, Kevin and Claire and others here to uh, liaise with the department to try to, uh, as we discussed earlier on, uh, accumulate whatever material that we need in, uh, as early and advanced a stage as possible to allow us to conduct our business much more efficiently. Um, so can I suggest then that, first of all, that the, uh, the inquiry will uh, reconvene in closed session probably next week, if members think it's timely enough, uh, so that we can reflect on the evidence that we've heard so far and then decide our next steps. Chair, have we any indication when, we're, when Mr Sands is likely to be recovered? Or do we know? Like, is it a... Is it a a minor ailment that's holding him back, or is it something more serious? Chair, uh, I understand that it required uh, uh, hospitalisation, and I understand that he's been possibly discharged in the last few days. But uh, it is, we were, when I, I attended the meeting that Mr. Uh, Hare alluded to earlier on in the week, I raised that point. It was clear that. Um, the department wouldn't countenance any contact with Mr. Sam. Two weeks, any at least two weeks. I mean, I would point out actually that uh, we actually heard indirectly that Mr. Sam wouldn't be coming here today, and I actually asked Kevin to clarify that. So it was actually upon our request that we were advised that Mega Sam wouldn't be here today. And I find that yeah. unusual to say the least. It's just we don't want to go on sitting waiting week to week. For Mr. Sands to complete this phase, yeah. if there's other things we could be doing in the next phase. <coughs> well, that's, I mean, let's let's take stock of where we're all at uh, next week, and then uh, can we, are, we, are we able to do it next week? In other, in other words, are we able to summarise properly and appropriately what we have uh, gleaned so far and what we've heard so far? Does that give us enough time to put a, a chronology of events in front of us and so on? Uh, do we I mean, I don't want to rush it here. I want to make sure it's done on a qualitative uh, basis as well. Chair, to, to be frank, I, I think it, from the Minister's point, I think it is tight given the amount of information that we, we do have. If it was the only thing that we were working on, we, we could do it. But if, uh, if members want to press for the 9th, we'll, we'll do our best. But the 16th would, uh, would be preferable for the committee team to put things together. This is the 9th. Sorry, Six, sorry, sixteenth. Yeah, sorry, sixteenth. I can't do it this that. afternoon, sir. I know that. Uh, <laughs> I know that. It's the day after my birthday. Uh, uh, yes, the sixteenth. We've got the sixteenth or the twenty-third. Yes. Okay. Well, so the issue now would be where we we'll go for the sixteenth or twenty-third. I, I was suggesting we'd really need two weeks to prepare, given the workload and so on. Well, we thought that. Volume of evidence. Well, we'd want to be as comprehensive as we possibly could and not miss anything. Um, so the tw 23rd... So what are we preparing? Really, uh, it would be a paper really from the committee staff just outlining the evidence that has been received before, establishing the facts. Facts. Uh, we're not drawing any conclusion from those facts. It's up to the members to do that. Uh, 
Th really, that's what we would be doing, and reflecting on then on the basis of that. Where do we go next? Do members want to call any f uh, more witnesses? Cross reference from the council. Yeah. We've heard and and cross reference. Uh, or whether indeed whether the members of the committee would like to hear from witnesses again. So, so that's really where we're, where we're going yeah. with this. But in the meanwhile, I think to answer your point, there, Jim, I mean we would be liaison because we do have to prepare for uh, the next phase anyway. So at an earlier stage, then we're, we're so parallel with this. That we'd also be liaising with the department just to prepare for phase two. I mean, all the terms of reference for that was we'll govern that. So, I mean, so will we resume this inquiry then on the 23rd in closed session to start take where we're at? Are members are content with that? Okay, we'll, we'll move on that basis. Thank you, members, for that. Okay, so we're moving then back to the committee agenda. And uh, we're dealing now with item number eight, which is supporting of uh, legislation. Um, the first item we have in eight point uh, is the SL1, the pension protection fund, occupational pension, so on and so forth. Um, the, I mean, we're, we're being advised that this is an issue of uh, parity. Right. I'm just telling you that's what we're advised. Um, that would be the rule itself would be subject to negative resolution before the assembly. The uh, GP started being mm -hmm. is expected to be made in January, this 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 January, coming into force on the 31st of March, uh, and it is proposed and the department proposed then that we make the uh, similar uh, rule. Um, so our members content that uh, we would make this rule. Agreed. And agreed. Okay. Thank you for that. Item number nine then the uh, proposed secure tenancy notice regulations. That's on page thirty five of your papers. Uh, and are members uh content for statute to be made? Right. Right. Okay. Item number ten, the housing benefit. Housing executive to determine his local housing allowance. Uh are members content then with the, this particular statute rule. Um we did discuss the uh SL1 on the uh, 12th of December. Uh, now I'm advised that the SR has changed slightly from that which was stated in the SL1, but I don't think it's any substantive uh, change. No, I'm sure we haven't yet received a response from the. Okay. okay. Now we did we did seek a, some uh, information from the department as to what particular areas may well be affected and so on. We haven't actually got that response. Do we have any time to for this? Did we get the information? Is there any time problem for us on this? No, this is not a word. Not a word, that chair. I mean, it's just because we did ask for information. Members wanted information. We haven't got that yet. So normally we would just wait until we got that information. I'm not aware of any time constraint or any time problem pressing problem. So I'm suggesting then we just defer this until we get that information. Okay. Good. Uh, moving on then to 11, the statutory rule, the job seekers allowance, habitual residence. I uh, suspect this may be a little more difficult. Um, this was deferred, I, I, as I understand it, this was held back from December. Uh, has came in to operation on the 1st of January. Um, I would just draw people's attention to the fact that whenever we were dealing with the Welfare Reform Bill the Committee stage, we received evidence from a number of organisations at Law Centre, I think at least one, NICE and another, which referred to some European legislation. I'm not quite sure of the detail at the moment, but it's, I mean I believe that this relates to that issue. So uh, Mickey Brady, you want to comment on this? <coughs> I think Chair, this was rushed through I think on the first of January. <coughs> Cameron mentioned it before Christmas. Um, more to do with xenophobia, I think, than social security legislation. And if you look at what's happened recently, uh, we had the Polish Prime Minister on um, protesting about the um, stigmatisation of <coughs> Polish people who are being accused of coming up over here as so-called, in inverted commas, benefit tourists. And in fact, the vast majority, and certainly all the ones that I've ever done any deal with, are working and contributing very much to the local economy. So this is aimed specifically, I think, at people from Romania and Bulgaria, who are now accession countries <coughs> from the 1st of January. So I would certainly uh, want it on record that I would have severe reservations about this kind of knee-jerk 
um, social security legislation, which has more to do with Tory ideology than um, actual uh, dealing with what they consider to be a problem, again, in inverted commas. Well, uh, um, sorry. I mean, uh, given that in the rest of the United Kingdom, from the 1st of January, anyone who comes into the United Kingdom cannot claim benefit for the uh, first three months, um, there will be an implication if we have a different rule here in Northern Ireland. Um, and I think it's perfectly reasonable mm -hmm. for us to say that if someone comes here with the clear intention of never having made any contribution to Northern Ireland um, or to the United Kingdom, uh, still wanting to have uh, job seekers allowance, uh, that, that then, you know, uh, to me, it's, it's reasonable to say. It. In fact, I'd say I think three months is probably too short. But uh, nevertheless, we should not um, we, we should not be bearing um, a financial burden, and we will yes, because if it's, if it's a different rule here than there's in the United Kingdom, yes. we'll be the ones who pay for it. Um, well, well, so well, I think I think therefore we should accept this yeah. um, as part of. The party legislation. Well, can I suggest? I mean, because it, it, it would spark a debate. There's no doubt about that, and that's fair enough. Uh, but I mean, the rule uh, will come into does has come into operation on the first of January. So, uh, I mean, my preference would be to have a, a, a brief to, to defer it and, and have a briefing from the department. I suppose they vote. I mean, obviously, I'm going to vote one particular way. This is one individual member in the table. Um, because it, it would require an angular resolution to change from from uh, coming into operation. So, I mean, for me, there's no urgency for us to uh, support the proposition in front of us today. So, I'm, I'm, I'm really open to members. Uh, I mean, are members happy enough that we defer it and take a briefing from the department ASAP, or we can go straight to the vote tomorrow? Well, Chairman, I prefer we go straight to the vote. Yeah, okay. well, what, what's the briefing going to tell us? Mm -hmm. but, uh, we don't know. Unless we're going to extend it to three years rather than three months. I, don't know, I think we should go on with it. Well, we don't, for my, my problem is that this thing was rushed through, so it has, no. you know, and we had no discussion about it before as a committee. So, as I say, it, 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 I mean, deferring the matter makes no material <coughs> impact on the rule because it is there. <coughs> I mean, the provision is there. So, deferring it or other makes no material impact. Well, purely on the basis that I don't think we're going to. We're going to be any better informed after uh, a briefing, as opposed to uh, what we know at the moment. Um, I would propose that we simply accept the, the change. Okay. Well, then we'll just. I mean, remember, to have enough time. We go to a vote on that. So I read the motion uh, on into the rack. Sorry, Chair. Can I just make my point before you do? In 1995, the Tories also introduced habitual residence legislation, which actually affects people who were born and reared here, who have gone abroad to work. <coughs> come back to live here more than it affects EU citizens. Mm -hmm. Just want to make a point. I would also make the point: the fact that it's been introduced uh, doesn't make it good and less punitive. That's the point that I'm simply making. It's bad legislation. It's knee-jerk. If they had a thought that the new Romania and um, Bulgaria were going to be accession countries a long time ago, they had plenty of time to sort it out. What we get now is basically xenophobia. I think we'll accept that the, the Tories haven't always got it right. In 1998, let the prisoners out of jail, but sure, we are where we are, you know. Well, uh, yeah, well, f fortunately, um, uh, still. Well, 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 not assume that the committee will be content. So we have to take a vote. First of all, is the committee content for the rule to be made? And in other words, those in favour of the rule to be made. And we'll, I mean, we will have to record this just. And that, that's four members and their names. You have all their names. And those opposed. Now, on the basis that the committee formally, by way of vote, is content, and I read the motion and the record. That the Committee for Social Development have considered statutory rule SAR, SR 308.13 and the Job Seekers <coughs> Individual Residence Amendment regulates Northern Ireland 2013 for subject to the examiner of statutory rule report has no objection to the rule. All agreed? All agreed. Agreed. All agreed? Those who are agreed, agreed. Agreed. And those who are not agreed, not agreed. Okay, so moving on then very swiftly.
Uh, I mean, I really don't intend to see all this correspondence. Um, I mean, Sure. Some can, I, can, I, can I raise just one issue on the um, correspondence, and it's on page 201. It's the request from the Department of the, the Committee for the Environment, their inquiry by into wind energy, which obviously does have an impact on the work of this committee, uh, given the uh, cost of wind energy and the, the way in which it falls on consumers and our interest in, con in fuel poverty. Um, you may argue that it's the, 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 that's not strictly a planning issue, but since economic considerations can now be taken into, um, uh, uh, can be considered when uh, planning applications are being looked at, I really do think that the terms of reference ought to have some, um, and I think that this committee ought to be asking that the terms of reference include the economic impact of. Um, the uh, of wind uh, uh, wind energy uh, on consumers um, and on businesses, uh, and uh, I think that we do have um, relevance in this committee, uh, given that we have we are expressing concerns regularly about fuel poverty. Um, I mean, let me just give one example. If the, uh, the department give the go ahead for the wind farm off Kilkeel which is proposed to um, supply 20% of our electricity by 2025, or whatever it happens to be, at a cost, and this is a strike price which the, the government has set at Westminster, of three times more than what um, the uh, electricity generated at Ballylumford and Kilroote would cost. That will put fuel bills up in Northern Ireland, energy bills, electricity bills up by 40%. Just on the basis that we're going to pay for 20% of our electricity at three times more than what you could get from a gas-fired power station, and I, I do think that this committee ought to therefore be um, asking that the terms of reference also include the economic impact um, on businesses and on consumers. Okay. Do we, do we want to actually to schedule a, a kind of a at least a reasonable discussion on that, Sammy, at a committee? And we can do that well in advance of the, the, the date of 20th of February. It's a relevant point. The committee has taken quite a keen interest on the whole issue of fuel poverty. And okay, so we schedule that then. Um, just a couple of items of correspondence I want to draw attention to. On, on uh, page 93, the Minister has uh, sent a letter uh, to the committee indicating that uh, erroneous information was given in response to a request activity from McCann. In relation to statistics referring to the number of benefit uh, sanctions and disallowances, John, you've received it. Okay, so thanks very much. Unless there's no comment to make on that, we'll move on. Um, so we also have uh, a letter. The department actually provided a link to the outcome of their consultation proposed change to the law regulating the sale and supply of alcohol. Um, and it was agreed at previous committee meetings that the, uh, we would return to the, the, these issues. Uh, now we had initially said that we'd return once we saw an announcement from the Minister on the way forward. So can I suggest that uh, all the members sort of take time to consider this document and then we'll come back to it as an item on the agenda. Yeah. Okay, so, I mean obviously there's a quite a amount of of uh, correspondence in the members' pack, so I'll just uh, prefer to leave it then for members to engage in that themselves. Anybody else want to raise anything particular on the correspondence? No. Okay. Moving on then to the next item, which is the forward work program. I'm just content to note the forward work program. Mm -hmm. um, any other business? Yes, Chairman. I've got some um, one issue that I'd like to raise. Um, this committee did the inquiry into the welfare reform, which um, I understand that the legislation now read <coughs> with person or in the, the, the executive or the person deputy first minister. I. Uh, spoke yesterday to the Minister for the Department of Work and Pensions. The £5 million fine um, is starting this month on a daily basis to be imposed on the executive. And I think, given again the demands which there are in resources, this committee ought to be writing to the First and Deputy First Minister asking what is happening with that legislation and pointing out that from this month on we are going to be for no reason other than the stalemate that exists 
and the Assembly, we are going to be handing £5 million, escalating up to £20 million per month to the Exchequer. And I do not think that there is any justification for it. And I think that this committee, again, would be remiss if, knowing that the penalties have started this month, we, we were not to ask the question what is happening with um, a report which uh, the committee has completed and sent to the, uh, the, the Executive. I'm mean, happy enough if a letter goes to the Minister or if the OFMDFM to clarify what legislation stands. Can really why there's some you mentioned five million daily. No, five million. I know, I know you're five million a month, sorry. Yes, no, it's it's been imposed. It's, 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 it's been imposed on a daily basis. I'm really worried there for a minute. Okay, so then the meeting. Okay, so not, nothing else under any other business, so the meeting now stands adjourned and we will resume on Thursday the sixteenth of January. Thank you very much.